Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the Construction Estimator. In this week's training, I'm gonna show you how to create incredible construction or any type of estimates with a very unique tab feature I've never taught before. We're also gonna be able to add clients, edit clients on the fly, add or edit items on the fly, and we're gonna have a unique mini dashboard along with printing, emailing, and a whole lot more. I hope you'll stick with us, so let's get started. Thanks so much for joining me. I've got a really fantastic training with a brand new unique feature I have never taught before. Certainly we have taught tabs before, but never in this way. Quickly, easily, simply, I'm gonna show you how we do that and a whole lot more through this incredible construction estimator. This template is absolutely free. All I ask is for your name and email and I'll go ahead and get that sent right over to you through email or through Facebook Messenger. I create these trainings each and every week or soon to be every other week, but we'll, we'll certainly make sure to bring you amazing content always and the best way to do that is to subscribe to our channel that way you get notified when you click on that notification icon bell i certainly do appreciate it there are many ways to support this channel this content training is free however if you do want to support us a great way to do that is through our patreon platform because on our patreon platform i bring you even more in fact additional training for example last week or we had the shopping manager i think it was two weeks ago shopping manager where we created this really cool drag and drop shopping manager well based on your request i added even more on our patreon platform we now have the ability to add different stores so we can create multiple stores multiple different aisle configurations and with the admin screen we now have can add different aisles for different stores we've got we can assign different categories on different stores so it's really an incredible feature thank you for your suggestions on that that is available this workbook template along with the training that coincides with the adding of stores on our patreon platform so i hope you'll get that the links down in the description excel for freelancers patreon is where it's all at all right so let's get on this training because i've got a lot to share with you so we'll go over an overview and then we'll get into the details of exactly how i created this every step every line of code every function feature and conditional formatting i will bring to you so grab your beverage of choice i will be creating this every step of the way as we as i've created it and i'm going to go over every detail with you all right so what we have here is it's a relatively basic application in the sense that we have an admin screen where we go over some defaults we've got item categories now what i like about this is these item categories are dynamic so that means as the users add these categories here we those tabs are then automatically customized here accordingly so if we were to change something if we wanted to add an additional one or we wanted to change this maybe to an additional type of expense maybe you had field labor you wanted to separate out your field labor and your local or office labor maybe you had some office let's do office maybe you have office expenses associated with the project as you see there we now have office here so office is automatically updated inside the tabs and we'll go ahead and bring that back to where it was which was commit mission and but you can see how it's very versatile in the fact that we can do that create it so when we add that and automatically update it notice that that tab automatically gets updated and of course when we click on that we notice that all the commissions are added per job one of the great features of this is a drop down list and it's a dynamic drop down list so we here have here a set of items right these items are for uh, any type of item you want however when we click on the equipment tab we see that it is equipment right now the great feature of this this is that these are actually the same cells we're not changing any columns we're not changing any rows in the past our tab features has have hidden columns or hidden rows but in this case we are not doing that so actually I'm going to show you a trick it's it's quicker it's easier and it is really beneficial with a few uh, challenges that we're easily able to overcome so each one of these are the same cells notice e9 right or, or let's say e13 in this case e13 we have a drop down list available of weekly daily service right we also can auto complete that if we have that so notice uh, we can do weekly service or anything like that just typing in the w even though even if it's not here for example let's say we have a brand new job and we go on to let's see equipment right or let, uh, let's go ahead and save this job first we'll add a customer here a project name here 
And then what we'll do is we'll just save that. Now, when we go into the equipment, notice that there's nothing here. We've got uh, information. All we need to do is to start typing it and it automatically comes up. That's auto populate. I'm going to show you how to create that. However, in the same column, notice the same column E9, notice the same column E9, right? So the same exact cell. Here we have a different list. Here, if we type in bathroom, it's going to come up, right? So notice that came up B-A-T-H. Let's bring that up again, B-A-T-H. There it is, bathroom vanity. Okay, so notice we have multiple multiple items on bathroom, so that's gonna take a little while to come up. Notice we have that. So also what I wanna do is also wanna have the ability to that autocomplete and a dynamic drop-down list. So this particular drop-down list is one way when we depending on, it's dependent on the tab. So when we click on the service tab, that drop-down list is monthly, weekly, or daily services. If I click on labor, that drop-down list in the same cell is hourly or supervised labor. So it's a dynamic based on the tab you're in, which is really helpful. It takes large projects like a construction job or construction, and it breaks it down into the project details and the types based on a category. Very, very important here. And of course, we have the navigation. We can print it, which is going to print it. Now, when we want to print it, we want all the items associated with that. We want all the items, the equipment, the travel and commission. We want that all separated very, very clearly, whether we're printing it or emailing. So I'm going to show you how to do that. It combines all of the items on that particular estimate and combines them all in a very organized manner. And of course, we can create a PDF if we want to create a PDF of that just by clicking PDF. That's going to create a very nice, organized, a very beautiful project estimate. And we'll show you how to do that. And of course, printing it and emailing, it's going to do the same thing. Basically, when we create an email, it's going to create some default subject. And of course, we have that same PDF here, but it's now been attached in an email format. So we're going to go over all of that. I'm going to show you every step of the way. So make sure you watch the entire training here. All right, don't forget to comment below, like it, and subscribe. Right, I respond to every Every single comment okay so we've got a set of item con categories now these item categories are based on you know whatever the user entered it is those item categories that are visible in the projects it are those item categories that are also located here inside our item database so it's the same ones it is those same item categories that when we want to create add or edit an existing if we click here we see that we're editing the existing right notice we have the item category up here if we want to create a brand new one, we select on a new row, and then we also have the available to have a new one. Notice that the category name items is default. However, if we're on a equipment and we decide to create a brand new one here, we click on here, we see that the equipment is set to the default. Of course, the user can change that, but it's nice to have that category set as the default based on the selected tab. Notice the selected tab will, will change the look of it, and there's no items on there. However, so it's a really, really some cool, really features in here. And so continuing on with the admin screen, we have a status, right? Each of our projects can have a status. That status is available in a drop down list right here located in N9. So we can have all those statuses. So we know the status. And then we have a pr we have also in the admin screen, we have our, some project defaults. What is the required profit margin? Perhaps I'm going to do something with this inside our Patreon platform. Maybe I'll do an additional dashboard when we hit or, but I put this in temporarily because I want to know when we're at or above a certain profit margin when we reach that. Our profit margin can be displayed here inside here. Our profit is 36%. And that is because we're able to track both the costs and the price of the job, the total cost of the job and the total price. So I may want to know when we hit a certain profit margin on an estimate. So we've got that here. I want to know if we're going to be including sales tax. And if we are, what is the name of that sales tax? And what is the rate of that sales tax? That is available. When we print it, we will see that that sales tax becomes obvious right here in the footer of that. We have a dynamic floating footer. I'm going to show you. So that sales tax 5% is going to be displayed in that footer. We'll be getting to that, of course, all of that. And also, Continuing on with the admin defaults, we also want to know if we're going to be including the date in printout. Sometimes we don't want to use the date. So if we change this to a no, we do not want to use the date. Sometimes we use the date. And what do I mean by date? I mean this date column right here, right? When we print it out, maybe we don't want to use the date column. Also, if we're going to be sending it to our customers, we certainly don't want the cost associated with that inside the printout. So if we decide to turn this off, no, that cost is not going to be in that printout. I also want to know the default project status. When I create a brand new project, what is the default status? Writing a bid, so you can create your any status you want, and then you can have that status available here. And basically all that means is when we create a brand new project, what do we want to locate it right here, writing the bid? All right, and also what is the default footer message? That default footer message is right here. So we have 
as many footer messages as we want, the name, and then the message itself here. And what that means is when we print that out, we want to know what is the default message. And that default message is right here. Notice in the footer it says this estimate is good for 30 days of the estimate. So that can be changed on when the printed and emailed out. It will be a visible at that point. So we have those defaults there. And the footer, that's it for the admin screen. Relatively simple. I've got a really cool background that I'm using on both the admin and the project. And that background is basically a picture that we can have when we change the page layout. So if I click on the page layout here and I delete the background, you'll see. And if I decide to add it in, I'm going to put that picture in. I'll work offline. I don't know why that message comes up in Excel. Kind of annoying. But I have that available for you. And of course, I'll make that available on the Patreon along with all of the other icons and everything else here. I have that available right here inside our Patreon platform for those of you who want to have your additional. So we got a construction estimator and I have this background in image right here and that's the one I'll be using okay so that's going to be kind of helpful all right so we see that and we've gone over the admin screen we've got a project database this is where all our project information stored we have a project ID we have the date of that project I've got the status I want to know the status of that project the client ID the customer and the client name the project name the supervisor sales representative the footer message use the total cost sales price and the estimated profit. So we're going to have all of that in there. And we're also going to be using data mapping to locate that. And basically, these data mapping is associated, if you haven't seen my trainings before, data mapping helps us reduce the code to just a few lines when we associate specific columns with specific cells, meaning the date column is associated with N3 right here on the project. So N3, and each one of those is associated with that. Okay, so that's how we map these column data to the specific cells located right here. All right, so we've also got an items database, item ID, the category, which is really important because we're going to need to know where to place that. We've got the item name, the description, the unit type, the item cost, and the sales price. So that means when we make changes in here or when we make changes on the pop-up, it's going to pull the information. So if I want to edit that bathroom vanity and I want to look here and I see that item here and I want to add that in here, but I want to make a change to that item. Maybe I want to change the cost of it. I could just simply click here and it's going to edit it. And maybe that item cost has gone down to $199. So I can go ahead and update that. And I can update that right here. When I save that, it is that information that's going to be placed up here. And it's automatically going to be updated here. If I decide I'm going to change the quantity, it's automatically going to be updated. So when I switch tabs here and go to equipment and then back to items, we want to make sure that that loads and it's automatically saved automatically. Okay, great. So that's going to come, our original data is going to come from the items. Then we have the project items. Now we notice that we have inside this project number four, we have several items. We have equipment. We don't have any service, but if we want to put service, monthly service, or we want some kind of weekly service, we can do that. And also the labor, shipping, and all the information that's associated with that. But we need to keep track of them in a database, right? Where is it located? So it's located right here. And that means all of these items are associated with project number one. If we take a look at project number one, right, we have several items. We have a service, labor, shop, shipping, travel. So all these are associated with project ID one. If I want to locate that, I just type in one here. It's going to load that project ID. We see we've got several items. We've got for uh, equipment, we've got some service items, labor items, we've got shipping items, travel. So this takes a away a lot of the confusion when it comes to estimating, especially when we have a large estimates. We want to break down those estimates into, you know, anywhere from five or six or seven or eight different categories. We can do that very easily with this. Now you could easily add this to any type of a project, right? Project estimate or project job or project scheduling could easily be added. We've created those in the past, okay? But we need to store those, and this is where they're stored, right? So we want to know the category. I want to know the item ID. I want to know the date. When was it added in? If there's a date column, the item name, the description, the quantity. Remember, the date here is associated with this specific date right here. So that's important. And I also want to know the unit, right? How many units? Is it a pair each? The item cost, the total cost, the item price, the total price. The project rows is associated, and that means row 9, 10, or 11 is associated with this row here, 9, 10, or 11. So that means when I save that information, I want to make sure that it comes back into the exact same row it was saved one before. So it is important to save the row that's associated with that. And I also want to know the database row. What is the row associated with this? If this is row 4, row 5, row 6, I want to make sure to save that. We can do that with the formula row. 
Okay, great. And then of course, lastly, in our database, we have a list of clients, a client ID, name, address, city, state, zip, phone, and email. Relatively simple with the clients. When I add or update a new client, I want to make sure that it gets sorted in alphabetical order. So if I go back to projects and I click on, let's say we want a new job and we, we put in, let's say, John Smith, and he's no, no longer in the list, I want to be able to add him very, very easily. Simply, it says here, a pop-up, John Smith is not currently a client. Would you like to add this client? Yes, it's going to pop up. Let us know. We can put in an address for that client. Whoops. One, two, three, four, five, here. Main Street, okay. And then we have LA, California, and then just put in a zip code. I want that automatically to add in automatically, and then we can do that, John at Gmail. So simply clicking save, it's automatically gonna load that information in. If I decide I wanna edit that, it's gonna edit. We're gonna pull that up information. If I wanna make a change, very, very simple. And I wanna save that. I wanna make sure all that gets saved to a database, and that's gonna get saved down here. So we have that new client ID that's automatically added. We've got the street and all the information that's added right here, and we can pull it up again very, very easily inside. And I wanna make sure that that name gets sorted in alphabetical list. So notice that name is brand new name is here and it is sorted accordingly um, alphabetically. So I want to show you how to do that as well. And of course, we're going to be able to add this really cool dashboard where we've got a donut chart and a pie chart. We want to know the prices per category and that's going to be based on the project that was selected. So we're going to get, we've got, it's a very, very, it's a, it's a kind of a tight application, right? Just this one feature, but it's really, there's so many cool features, features built into it. The only way you know how many features if you stick with us. So I know my trainings tend to be longer, but I guarantee you they're going to be packed with great content, great learning, new features that you can apply in your own applications today. Okay. If you do want to learn how to build these applications by yourself and of course sell them for passive income, check out our mentorship program. In fact, I've got a brand new New mentorship express which is all the same content of my mentorship but it's packed into five months where you get six hours a week of training and it's a brand new low price i'll include that link down below okay great so what we're going to be doing here the first part is how do we create this really cool dynamic tab feature meaning how do we get these tabs created automatically if we want to add a new one right if i want to add a new one i want that automatically to come in and automatically notice now that that test is right here of course there's no uh, items under that but we could easily create that and how do we want to do that if i decide i want to create a brand new item for that test i could do that and it's automatically going to be here very very cool right very very dynamic very easily user friendly if I delete that here I want the projects tabs to be automatically updated here notice the test is gone so how do we do that very very cool okay so the first thing what we want to do is we want to be able to create these tabs across it now all these tabs have actually already been created if we look into the selection pane there's a maximum of eight because we have a space constraint so if we take a look let's say I think it's right about here at an item button right about here group 41 I think this is it I should, should have updated okay so if we take a look at this one right here see this tab right here this tab has already been created it's called category eight right so we have a maximum of eight categories maximum of eight categories however there's nothing on the eighth one so that of course has been hidden it's been hidden right here right so all we need to do is basically show and hide these tabs accordingly and of course i'm going to show you how we get the contents of those tabs a really really cool uh trick how we get that uh the totals of those tabs so how do we do that first let's go into macro and see exactly how we created the position of this won't matter because it is vba that takes care of that position automatically so when we add in notice that that test is automatically in the right spot here so let's take a look at the macro that gets created now that macro it starts out when we make a change anywhere from c7 to c14 so we're going to go into vba and see exactly how changing those cells can automatically create and update those tabs accordingly okay well that's of course going to come inside our vba if you want to get to the vba just click on the developers or alt f11 is a shortcut that will get you there and we've got several modules here and we got a client module an item module that's going to take care of our items project which is focused on the project saving updating uh, deleting the project and the project sheet macros which is some of the ones on the sheet that's where we're going to start out so in the admin screen here just a few lines of code when we make a worksheet change right when we're making a change from c7 through c14 that's where our categories are located we're going to run a macro called category tab updates category tab updates that's a macro that runs it's going to automatically update those tabs it's located in the module called project sheet macros 
And here it is right here. It is that first macro, okay? So the first thing what I want to do is I want to determine how many we have, right? Now I've got a named range. I want to know how many categories we have. If we look in the formulas, we've got a name manager. We're using, of course, our categories. It's called categories right here, that first one here. And we're using a dynamic named range to create that using the offset formula. So we've got seven items in our categories. Really, What I really want to do is I want to determine how many are there, right? How many items are in that? So we need to loop through all those categories and create those tabs or display those tabs and position them accordingly. Okay, so what we have here is that particular name range. Now with that name range, what I want to do is determine how many are in them. So we're going to create a long variable called category quantity. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the application worksheet function count A. Count A, of course, is the same as we would be in the formula. And I want to determine inside this named range from the admin how many items are in that. And this is going to be seven, right? So now that we know how many, what we want to do is we want to determine the width of it. Now, if I look in the projects, right, I want to know the width of each of these tabs. I want to make sure that they all have the same width. That's nice. And I want to stretch it automatically uh, on these columns from column D all the way through column L. I want to make sure that however many or however little, they, they come across this and they're all the equal sizes. So what I want to do is determine the width of D through L, all the columns. And that way, if we increase the columns or shrink the columns, they're going to go along with it. I want to know how many of those that categories should fit on here and divide that and determine the, the width for each particular tab. So we can do that through just a little bit of math. That width of each of that shape is simply going to be the width of those columns from D to L. And we're going to divide that by the number of categories. So for example, if the width was 7D and we had a particular seven quantity, we'd know we'd have a width of 10. Okay, so it's simple division to do that. I want to set that initial left position and the initial top position. Now remember, all of these have been created already. It's called category one, category two, category th category three, right? So they're all named already. They're all they're either visible or they're hidden, but they're all on the sheet. All eight tabs are already on the sheet. So to do that, what I want to do is I want to set that initial left position. We're going to set that initial left position as column D and the top position based on actually row seven. So row seven is going to be that. So that's what we're going to set. Set that a, a left position based on column D seven or column D, any row would be fine. Okay, so once we have that top position and the initial left position, we can then loop through all of the shapes and make sure they're positioned right. So to do that, we're going to loop. We're going to create another long variable for the category number equals one to eight. Now we're going to go through all of them. We need to know whether we're displaying them or hiding them. And of course, where they're positioned. So if the category number equals less than the category quantity, meaning we have eight, let's say we have our category quantity seven, but we get to number eight. If we get to number eight, we're going to do something else, right? We're going to hide that category. Otherwise, we're going to display it. Now to display it, we would do the following. So we already have all eight shapes already. So with the category and category number, meaning anywhere from one through eight, we're going to set the left position to the left position, the top position to the top, the category width, that unique width that we've already calculated, and we want to make sure it's visible. What we're going to do is we're going to update that left position. I want to move it over to the right, that left position, but how much? Well, it's current position, plus we're going to move it the width of that shape, right? The exact width of that shape is going to move it over to the right the exact amount that we want to. Otherwise, hide the category, right? Otherwise, meaning otherwise, let's say we're on number eight, we know that there's not eight categories, so we want to hide that eighth one. So let's just put those hidden categories, hidden or non-existing, hidden for non-existing categories, non-existing. Okay, all right, so that's how all we have to do to actually create those. Relatively simple, but now what I want to do is you notice that there's no text in here. We're not placing the text. That text has already been placed, right? And notice the deck text is dynamic, right? So they're linked to a particular cell because one, I want the text to include the item category, which is dynamic based on whatever the user enters here. And two, I want to know the totals of that tab of that particular tab. And as we increase them, I want them to be also increased. So this number items 4617 is going to change when the user changes that automatically as soon as they make the updates. Now here's the tricky part um, and a great challenge. And of course, we're going to show you exactly how to do it. Here's the tricky part, right? As we move to the tab, this 
notice the data in this all changes, right? So how do we get this to save? And notice that these are the same cells, right? But what I want to make sure to do is as soon as I move over, we're going to save this data, all this information. It's going to get saved in this database right here. It's going to get saved all the way to the end, right? So how do I know and make sure that if we're on a specific tab, it is that data that's automatically get it updated. So this data here, the, the, the totals here, is coming from our database, meaning it's coming from here. So we're going to get into that in a little bit as far as how we create it. But we want to make sure that we're totally, these totals on the current tab are updating as we make changes or as we notice that the tab, the total in this tab is automatically changing as we add items automatically here. So we can see that as we add here a different item, it's automatically going to get updated very, very easily. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, of course, we got to link it to a cell. If we take a look on here, clicking here, we see this is linked to cell B17, B18, and so on and so forth. So let's take a look at those admin columns, columns A and B, and see how we We've linked them. So the first thing what we want to do is link this particular to, of course, our admin. We could just as easily link it directly to here. So we've linked this. I could just easily, probably easier just to do this equals admin, whatever's located right here. We don't need an indirect formula for that, something for another reason. So here's what it is. So I've got this, basically these are linked to exactly, just to make it a little bit easier, link them directly to the categories in our admin screen. Next up, we have B17 all the way through B24. This is the cell that's linked directly to the tab here. And what I want to do is basically I want to create a total. And the total is going to be for everything that we have for this category, right? So I've created some named ranges that are going to help us with that total. And I'm going to show you how that works. So let's go over a few of those named ranges because what we really want to do is we want to total those totals based on what's located in this database, the project item database. So if we go into the formulas and then name manager, we'll take a look at some of those formulas. Now, the project items, we've got one called project items category, and it's going to be associated with the category because we're only summing totals based on a certain category. That's very important. And also it's going to be, so we're going to use this offset to do that. And of course, we also want to know for a specific project ID. It's got to be for the selected project ID and not for all the projects. We also want to know the total cost. That's going to be helpful help us out for some of our uh, graphs and we also have the project the total price which is we're going to be using so the total price so I've got these four particular named ranges that are going to help us in those formulas so the basic idea was I want to sum all the total price for items for project one right and I want that total to appear directly inside here now that's all good and dandy, right? So it's very easy just using a sum if sum if based on this project ID, project two, based on this category, the selected category. Now that selected category, which we haven't gone over yet, is going to appear directly in B5. Whatever category we select, B5 is going to take on that category. So this is the category. So, so basically what I want to do is I want to sum all the categories. And then what I want to do is make sure, however, there's a little trick. So we're going to base it based on what's on the database, right? But what if I do this? What if we're summing all the items based on the database that's been saved. But what if I add a new one here? If I add a new item here, we haven't saved it to the database until I click save. As soon as I click save, it's saved. So how can I, if the, if all those totals are based on the database, how can I get this to update? We say certainly we'll just update this. Just total this. That's fine. That's great. But what about when we switch to this tab, right? How do I make sure this is updated? So the idea is this. The selected tab, whatever selected tab is, we are going to use this, this total here, this column here, L. However, for every other tab, we are going to use what's in the database. As soon as we switch tabs, it'll save the database. I'll, so, I'll show you that. But so that's the idea. Whatever selected tab we are on, it's going to add in this total here is going to be based on what is located in this column. Everything else is going to be located what's in the database. Okay. All right. So that's how we're that that's the main idea behind this particular formula here. So let's take a look at this formula. Okay. First of all, I want A17. A17 is, of course, that particular item category. I want that item category as the first part, right? Because I want to show that item. And then next up, I want a space. So we're going to put a space in there. And next up comes the total. And basically the selected tab, we're using column L. If it's not the selected tab, we're going to base it on the database. So here it is right here. If B5 equals A17, B5 meaning the selected category equals A17, we are then going to add up 
whatever is in column L. So we're going to use the sum. We're using, and of course, we've wrapped it around text. I want to round up. I don't want, I don't want, I don't have a lot of room in these tabs, so we don't want the decimals, right? So the reason I want to get rid of the decimal points, I'm going to use round up. And I'm going to add that into the sum. So basically, I'm, I'm going to sum everything that is in column L, and I'm going to round it up. I don't want any decimals, so I'm going to show this zero. And I want it in this format, okay? So I want the currency symbol. So what that's going to do is add up everything in the tab, but only if B5 equals A17, right? So in this case, we're on equipment. So in this case right here, it is B5 equals A18, equipment. That's the tab that we're on. Same formula here, L. However, however, if it is not the selected tab, I want to pull the sum from the database. And we're going to use the sum ifs for that. We're still going to use roundup, but this time we're going to use sum ifs. I want to know the project total price. That's what we're going to be summing in from the database. And I want to know the project based on the project ID located in N2. N2 is our project ID number two. And I also want to know based on the project item, based on the category of A18, right? So I want to know all of the items for that specific project for the equipment and i want to total that up so that way we're going to get the total regardless so that means the selected tab is always going to be dynamic based on the items we add so the more we add the more this number goes up right however as soon as we switch it has already been saved that 815 has already been saved into the database because switching these tabs is running the macro which i'll go over to in just a moment that'll be the next macro we go over it's automatically going to save you so i just added daily and weekly service if we look in the project item we scroll all the way down we see those items daily weekly service right here those two items just got added for project two two items service right 20 those are the item numbers so we have all this information saved in the database. So that formula, the sum ifs formula, now is going to total up the service and it's going to add in these two items. So it saved it. So it's really, really cool because it automatically saves it as soon as we switch tabs. Now switching tabs, if you didn't know already, as soon as we switch tabs, and we're going to go into this macro, it's going to load up only those items from that project, or it's going to load only those equipments from the product, only those services that's going to load up into this section. So it's very, very simple we're just going to use an advanced filter to do that okay but right now so i wanted you to understand how we got to this formula and guess basically to sum it up that selected tab right that selected tab we're going to use this sum every other tab otherwise we're going to sum it from the database okay so as long as we've linked these to the specific cells that's how we get this dynamic content on these tab headers and we can out of, get a sum of all those very very easily okay great i'm so i'm glad i got to go over that with you now let's move on to the next one which is that selected tabs now when i select the tabs what do i want to do basically what i want to do is i want to clear i want to make sure to one save any changes that the user is making we're going to run this macro and basically it's this macro right here which is going to save that project the only difference is I don't want this fade out message to appear. I only want this fade out message to appear when the user clicks save. Although everything else is the same. So when they click this, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to save it. The second thing that's going to happen is I want to color these differently. Now we can't use conditional formatting because these are not cells. These are shapes. All right. And I also want to make sure this is bold and I want to switch the colors. Notice that it goes from light blue to medium blue. However, normally it's medium blue to white. Okay. So I want to change that and we want to change that to bold. And what I also want to do is I want to determine the selected tab category, which is category here, items. And I want that to be used as a criteria so that we can take all these project items and we only want to load those items that are associated one with this project and two with this category. Okay. And we want only those items to appear as results. And then we're going to bring only those items and bring it directly inside the projects right here. Okay. So let's go through that macro now. And that's the next macro called category select. That is the macro that's been already assigned to these individual tabs, these shapes here already have been assigned this one called tab select so inside this macro what we're going to do is first of all what i want to know is i want to make sure that they've saved this project right it's very important if i'm going to be switching tabs i need to make sure to save it and of course i want to make sure that the project got saved and that means when we click on a new project if i try to switch tabs i want the user to say hey please save this project before switching tabs right so all they need to do is put in a customer click save and it'll automatically be safe so that's important. And how do we know that? Well, we would know that if B2, and let's take a look at some of these. I've got a project load. I want to know when we're loading the project. Now, this is important because 
in one instance, VBA is going to make some changes here. As we load in those tabs, VBA is going to make a change. In another instance, user is going to make a change. I want to differentiate between those two types of changes. This one, B1, is going to help me do that, right? When the VBA is making those changes, loading it in, this is going to go to true and back to false. It happens very quick. I also want to know that the project row, what is the row that's associated with this project? I've got a name branch called here, a name branch called project ID, and I've got a project ID located here too. So I want to know what row is associated with project ID 2. If we look in the project database, we see that project ID 2 is located on row 5. So I'm going to use a named range, and we're going to use a match to do that. So we can just use this matching based on N2, the project ID. And we're going to add 3 because we want to extract the row number. So that's going to get us. I also want to know the next project ID. We're going to use the max formula of project, making sure they're all numerical. And we're going to add one because we want the next one. If there's no data or there's an error, we're just going to revert it to one. I want to know the selected item row. I've got conditional formatting here, a few different rules. That selected row is going to change here as we select something else. So if we take a look at the conditional formatting, we've got three different rules. We're going to manage the rules. And we're going to use one for the selected row based on B4, just highlighting it in black in uh, black bold font and then of course the blue background then i've got one particular conditional formatting very slightly white color very slightly blue color it's very very slight for the odd rows this will work and for the even rows this will work notice that e9 right e9 is consistent that is our starting row and it's also the row that we're going to be using for the applies to notice it starts in applies to D9 through L200. Very good. So we've got that up there, that conditional formatting. That's going to be triggered by change in this. So the selection change event, which we'll get into, will put whatever the rows that's been selected here. We've got an item category here. Now this, and we've got the item tab here. Now when we select an item tab, it's like here, this is going to change to two. The, the macro that we're just about to go over is going to change this to two automatically. And then we have equipment. So what I want to do is I want to take this two and I want to pull equipment from it. How are we going to do that? Well, you can do it through index. Now we notice that we have a named range called categories, right? That's the same named range from the admin screen. It's this one right here, right? So if I, if I know that categories is here and I want to pull the second item from categories because it's a two, I can just simply use index for that and we're going to extract that equipment. So using that formula, index of the categories based on the based on the number of B6 is going to extract that categories. So all we need to do with our macro is simply do this. Get rid of the word category, remove it in our macro, determine the name of the shape that called it using application caller, remove the word category, and what's that going to leave us? It's going to leave us with the one, the two, or the three. I'm going to place that number directly inside B6. So let's go, go through that right now. So certainly we want to make sure that B2 contains a value. If it's not, let the user know to save that project. We're going to turn off application screen updating temporarily. And we're going to then, again, I'm going to run the macro that's going to save or update that. I want to make sure that we are saving that. We'll get into this macro in just a bit. This is the macro that saves the project. What it will do is it will save any new changes to new items in this row automatically as I switch the tab. And that way, it's saved to the database already. So when I come back, we can easily load in those items here. They're, they're remembered because they're saved inside the database. So this macro is going to take care of that right before we do anything else. Then what I want to do is I want to determine the category number. Remember that category number is based on the shape name. Here is the name of the shape. If we try to run this macro through this, often we're going to get an error. Why is that? Because there's no shape that called it. I called it from right here. Right? So make sure that when you use application caller, you have to run it from a shape that called it in. So what I want to do is I want to set that category number. And as I said before, if I remove the word category and I replace it with nothing using the replace command, it's going to leave us with that category number. And I'm going to put that category number into the variable. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to put that directly into B6. That is the category number. So now that I know the category number, I can automatically here set that item. So we know that's very important because I want that category number because I need to extract the name right from it. That name is going to help us in these formulas. That was very important. We need to know the selected tab. B5 is going to let us know the name of that selected category on that selected tab. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to reset all tabs. Now what we want to do, reset all tabs, is I want to set that selected tab. I want to change those colors from blue to white, from white to blue, and I want to put it to bold. So the first thing what we want to do is reset all of them back to their original color, which is this light blue to white and non-bold. So that's what we're going to do. So for the category number, one to eight, we have all those shapes. 
we're going to set that fill, that fill to that bl blue down to white. And that's going to be done right here. Category, category number, the fill. We want two color gradient. And to get this, to get this, all I did was just simply run a macro while I changed the color. And it came up with this and a little bit of other code. I just extracted that out. So it just turned out to be gradient horizontal two, horizontal number two. So that's pretty much it. And then the reverse was just one, so relatively easy. And I want the bolt equal false, right? We're taking every single shape and we're making the bolt false, right? We don't want a bolt and we want to set it back to that original color. That original color is this light blue on top and then white on the bottom. However, for the selected one, we want to do something different. How do we know the selected one? Because I've got that into a variable called selected category, the number here. If I know that, right, the shapes, the category, and the selected category, this is the one we've selected. This one we're going to change up. That's still the two color gradient, but the number is going to change to one. This particular one is simply changing the horizontal position from top to bottom and bottom to top. We don't really need to change the colors. It's the same colors. I'm just reversing the colors from top to bottom and bottom to top. So this one will do just the opposite, right? It's going to take that go from white to light blue. And it is that light, same light blue that we're using to color this, right? So if we take a look at that, format that shape, we see that we've got that fill here is basically just the two colors from the white, or actually it's quite light blue, to this light blue. So it's just those two colors. So all I'm doing inside VBA is simply basically just reversing the direction using these. Let's move that over here. So I'm just reversing it. Let's move that over here. I'm just reversing it inside VBA right here. I'm reversing these things. So one of them is type one here and one is type two. So that's all we're doing is just like reversing these two down and up, down and up. But we're doing it in VBA. So it's relatively simple in that manner. That's why we only have to change one to two and two to one. So this is the selected ca category from white to blue. And then also we're going to take that font and make it bold. So that's the only difference. Relatively easy to change those tabs, right? It's very easy. We don't need multiple shapes. We don't need to hide and show shapes. We just need to change the direction since we're using the same color. And that's going to set that selected tab apart from the other. So it gives it that tab so that the color is blended. If you're going to be doing this, just make sure that the blue on the board below is enough. And want to make sure that the height. And now another good thing, here's another thing that's kind of tricky that you wouldn't necessarily know. Um, really zoom into that. Now we don't want borders. The reason I don't want borders on these is because to take a look, there's no border on this shape. And I don't want a border because I don't want a separation. So all I've done is just lowered this shape below it. But you said there's no border, but how do I get this border that you notice that there does look like there's a border on the left and the upper? Well, that's actually a shadow, right? So when I format that shape, all I've done is given it a specific shadow on that. And that's going to help out us a lot. So if we take a look in the shadow, I've given it a little shadow and we're using this shadow one right here I'm using the upper left shadow here but upper left i think it's this one here sorry it's a little bit off the screen so we're giving that a shadow let's move that over just so you know which shadow i use i'm going to bring it over a little bit here so we can see it so it's this one this one right here now it's on the screen so it's this one right here so the upper upper left shadow is what i've given it and we've given it just simply one point and one point. So it's very, very small. But it is the shadow that creates that border effect. And that way we don't need to put an uh, actual border. Because in Excel, we, we can't control top, left, right, and bottom borders. We can only control border or no border. But we can use a shadow. So that's where we get this effect. So it gives us the tab effect. Otherwise, we'd have no borders at all. So that's kind of a nice effect without having to use borders. Okay, I'll place that down there. But VBA will, VBA will take care of that for us. And we just want to make sure that it's placed down low enough enough so that it blends the colors. It gives us a nice look. And so that's all we have to do. So again, it's the shadow we're using, not a border. Very, very helpful to give us that tab effect without having to use borders because we don't want borders separating it. We want that blend to show it. Okay, great. So that's how I gave it inside the VBA. That's how I was able to give it that particular colors. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to set that selected item list. It's very, very important that we know the list. And why is that important? Let's take a look here. We have a, we have a defined list inside here. Notice that in this list, we see that we have tile saw rental we only have those equipment however when we click on item same cell here right but different list same cell different list right how do we do that well we can do that with a dynamic named range if we take home the data and we go into the data validation here we see it's called item selected tab we have a named range called item selected tab and that's going to come directly from our items list so what i want to do is I want to create a dynamic named range called item list, and it's based on the items. And so that means that whatever we've selected, I want to know all of the unique items for this service. So if I click on project and I click on items, and we go back into this items list, 
notice that we have a different list. Same named range data, right? Same exact name range. It's called the selected item list. Let's look at that one more time, right? Name manager. And then we have the item selected tab here. Same name, we're using the offset items L2, and then one row down, count A. So here is a named range based on the results of an advanced filter. Now, what I want to do is I want to take all of our items. I want to create, I want to know only those unique items based on the items, and I want to have those appear here. Notice that the selected category is here. If I change it, right, again, we could simply do index categories B6. Actually, I could just do just, I think it'd be just a little bit easier to equals, right? Let's do equals because we always know that selected tab is going to be inside here and right up here. We don't need to base it on the number because I've got it right here in B5, right? So we know in B5, as B5 changes, right, we know that item will change here. Inside, it's going to change the equipment, right? So if I know the equipment that we tab and I want to know all the items associated, I want those results to appear right here. We can do that in VBA with an advanced filter. We're going to determine the last row. We've got our criteria, the category, and we want the unique items for that category. It is this unique items that make up our drop-down list. So we don't need to change the data validation on that because the contents of that dynamic named range will change automatically based on the results of this advanced filter. So it's that advanced filter that we're going to run right now inside to create that selected item list. Determining the last row based on the item sheet now. If it's less than four, we're going to exit the set. And then all we do is create an advanced filter. We have a criteria. Our advanced filter is going to go from A3 through G, right? Here's through G. Our criteria is J2 through 3, and our results are going to come into L2. And that's just what we've done here, J2 through J3. And then L2, that's where our results are coming. That This few lines of code creates a very, very cool dynamic name range. So that way, when the users are in the equipment tab, they only have a choice of those items that are equipment. If they're in the shipping, they only have the choice of those shipping items. It, it makes things a lot easier and a lot more organized when you create these detailed projects. And we can do that through that dynamic name range. And like I said, just a few lines of code. Okay, now what we want to do is I want to add the items from the selected tab, right? So how do we do that? And basically what that means is if there are any items that are associated with this project, I want those items to appear here. And so those are going to come directly from the project item database. So what I want to know is I want to know all the shipping items that came. Again, this is, again, I can just use... Well, we keep that there, but it basically this is the same thing. Project B6 is the same thing as whatever's in B5. So either one would work. This is probably unnecessary. So what I want to do is I want to know all of those items from the shipping on Project 2, and I want those to appear here. I want to bring those items in, and I want to place them directly inside here. And so that's what we're going to do inside this VBA. First of all, what I want to do is, again, remember I said project, I want to set B1 to true. I want to differentiate between when a user makes a change and when VBA is making a change. So when I make changes here, I want this to go to true, B1 to go to true. So we're going to start it out, B1 to true. And of course, before we finish, we're going to set it back to false. And so what we're going to do is first we're going to clear out all of the, remember, we've already saved everything. We've already saved it right here on that tab. We've already saved all the items in the project, in that tab here. So we can easily clear it out. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to clear out everything before, including before. Before is our selected item row. So before we want to clear out, we don't want to show any selected row. I want to clear out before. And I also want to clear out everything from D, column D, all the way through N. Well, you say, why N, right? N is going to be located. We have got some data located in N as well. Okay. Now we'll get into the data that's going to be saved, but there's two, there's data information located here. I should probably group this all so we can easily move it. I'm going to group this here. And then what we're going to do is that way we can easily move it. Okay. So group it and then we'll unselect this. And then, so basically inside here, we'll get to this in a moment. Inside here is we have some data in here. So right in here, I'm going to write in we have right here, this is our project, our item ID here. So I'm going to write in just temporarily item ID. I want to know the ID that's associated with the item. And I also want to know the database row. So I'm going to write a database row. Now they're here, already here, if you can see here. But they're hidden, right? And I like them hidden. I want to keep them. And they're hidden based on the custom format. If I go into the more number formats, you see that I've got two or actually two different semicolons. Actually, you could just put one here. If they're numbers, I can just put one. 
thank you. And then, uh, so we can just put one semicolon to hide them. However, if we want them displayed, we can just change them back to general format, general, okay? So that's gonna display it. And that means I know the item ID that's associated with each one of these individual items are all the same, right? If I change that, right, to shipping, right, you're gonna see a different item ID appear here. Let's click on that shipping here. And we see the different item ID is gonna show up here. Of course, it is located 12, it's just hidden, right? But it's here inside 12, okay. So, but I also want to know any database row that's been saved. What, what is the row that's saved? Notice this is 39. That is going to be the row that's associated with this item. If we take a look inside the projects and we take a look on row 39, we're going to find that particular item right here. So it is that item here. It's located on row 39, and here's the item ID. So when we save that, when I go ahead and click save, it's going to automatically, whoa, let's fix that here. All right, we'll reset that and set our titles. This would be item. I want to put these here. There we go. That makes more sense. Put them up at the top, those variables. They don't belong there now, do they? No, they don't. Okay, good. So we'll just delete that, and we can just reload that tab. We don't need that there. When saving that work, that'll update that. Okay. So we'll just update that. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna make sure when I make a change here, I wanna make sure that that item database is saved automatically in that, okay? So to do that, all we need to do is just select a different different number and we wanna make sure the item ID and the database row, if there's associated, are gonna be put in there. Okay, and I'll go ahead and change these to general too so you can see that they're all still custom. General, we can see the item ID and the database row that's associated with that. Okay, so we wanna bring all this information. So the first thing I wanna do is clear all the information. When we switch tabs, I wanna clear everything out and bring in those results. So we're going to clear all of those items right here inside our project sheet macros, clearing the existing items, okay? And now what I want to do is the add or edit button, add or edit item button shape visible equals false. And what is that? When we select a particular item and I wanna make sure to add or edit this item, I'm gonna show this little button here. This is called the add edit item button. I want that hidden. When I switch tabs, I don't want that button hidden. I only want that button visible when I select a specific item in column E. So we're gonna do that, we're gonna hide that button. We're gonna focus on the project item database. This is where we want to run our advanced filter, determining the last row, running an advanced filter, meaning only those items with project ID2, only those items associated with shipping. So our criteria is gonna be from Q2 through R3. So we want that Q2 through R3. Then what we want to do is have those results appear directly all the way from U all the way through AF. Okay, so let's bring that inside the code and take a look at that, determining the last row right here, the last project item database row. And we'll get, if it's less than four, that means there's no database items. We're gonna skip all this. We're gonna run that advanced filter from A3 through N, that criteria Q2 through R is what I mentioned here, inside that criteria Q2 through R, and the results are coming from U through AF, and that's where we want that U through AF. Okay, so now that we have those results, I wanna determine the last row of those results. I'm gonna use column V to get that last, because that's an item name and that's required. V is going to determine the last row, making sure that we have, if we don't have any results, we can skip. If we do have, we're going to take all that data, including the date and the row, all the way up to this, and we're going to bring it over. But to do that, I want to make sure that we're going to bring it over in the right place. So we need to run a loop. I want to put this line in row 9. I want to put this in row 10, right? Normally, we wouldn't have two 9s, but we had a issue there. So that's all we need to do. Just bring it all in. So we want to know what row they're associated with that. So how are we going to do that? Well, the best way to do that is, of course, with that advanced filter and running that loop. So let's bring it up. Okay, I got a lot of items in this one. And so we're going to run that loop. So determining the last row, if it's less than three, we're going to no items. And now we're going to start our loop. Starting in row three, that's where our results, that row three is where our first row is coming of our results. And we're going to loop all the way to the last row. Determining what row inside here, nine, 10, 11, what row is it going to go inside? So getting that row and putting that into a variable, that row is gonna come directly from column AF. If we bring this down, we see that that's coming from AF. So I'm gonna put that into a variable called item row. Now I know what row to put that in. I know exactly what row inside here, row nine, 10, 11, so, so on and so forth. Okay, so what I wanna do is all the way from projects D through N, starting right here, D, all the way through and I want to bring that item ID, I want to bring that database row all the way and bring it all the way and it's going to come directly from here, all the way from U, all the way through AE, not the project row, but just from here, all the way through AE. So basically we're going to bring it all that data over. 
D through N gonna, from the item row is going to come from U through AE of the result row, just bringing that data in. And I also want to make sure that our formulas are down here. The formulas are very important because notice there's when I just bring in the value, but I really want a formula here. Inside the total cost, I want a formula. Why is a formula important? Because if the user decides that they're going to change that quantity, I need to make sure that that total cost gets updated. I could do it through VBA, but we can also do it through a formula. So what I want to do is I want to replace whatever values here with the formula, basically G10 through I10, or the same thing with the total, right? So again, we're replacing the values with the total, and that way, when the user changes the quantities, the formulas update. So we can do those right here. So we J the formula that would be for the cost formula is simply going to be G times I in the item row, whereas the total price formula is G through K, right? So we're simply just taking either G the quantity and through I the item cost or K the item price and creating that total price or the total cost so they can update. So we're updating with formulas. And so that's it. So all we need to do is a loop through. That's going to bring in all the items associated with the tab along with their given formulas. OK, we're going to set the project load to false and turn on application screen updating. That is it. That is all the macro that we need to just switch tabs and have that data come directly from the tabs. OK, very, very good. Next up, I want to create previous and project, right? Previous project and load next project. We have those here. That's going to load up. So how do we do that? Well, I just need to determine what project we're on. And if I go previous, obviously, this is the first one. I want to let these know you're at the first project. So previous is the first one we're going to do. And how do we do that? Well, the first thing what I want to do is I want to determine N2 with the projects N2. I want to know the lowest number, right? What is the lowest number of our project IDs? If I look here, the minimum number is one. So we can't go below that. The maximum number is five. We can't go above that. So what we're going to do is we're going to determine using the minimum function. And we can use this application worksheet minimum. And I want to know what the minimum number is in all of the project IDs using that named range. If N2 is already at the minimum, if we're already at the lowest number, and why is that important? Why can't we just check to see if it's 1? Because if the user deletes project 1, then 2 is our lowest number. So we want to use the minimum because we don't know it's not necessarily going to be 1. If they delete the first two projects, 3 is going to be our first one. So we want to use the minimum. It's going to ensure that the user can't go beyond the first one. If they try to go previous beyond the first one, we will let them know with this particular message box. Otherwise, what I want to do is I want to go to the previous one, right? If I know that on project four, I want to know what is the previous one. Now, I can't assume that it's three because if I delete row six, if we decide we're going to delete project, it's going to go from four to two, right? So what I want to do is I want to determine what row four is on and I want to look at the row above it. Whatever project ID is the one that we're going to place in. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to determine the project row. We're going to wrap it in on air resume next and on air goes there just to make sure in case it's not found, it would create an error. So we're going to use the find command and I'm going to look for that project ID. I'm looking for whatever's in N2. And I'm looking directly in the project IDs. And I want to extract the row from it. That row is going to go into this variable. If I know the row, and I want to make sure that row is not 0, and I also want to make sure it's not 4. If it's 4, it would be the first one. But I want to make sure. So if it's not 4 and it's not 0, then I just want to determine whatever's in the A and the row before it. I want to take that value and I want to place it directly inside N. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. N2 simply equals the project A and the project row minus 1. Set the previous project ID. Then we're going to run a macro, which I'll go over in just a moment, called project load. We're just going to load all the data in for the project. OK, next project, very, very simple. This time we're going to check to see if we're at the last one using the max function, right? So we want to know the maximum function. So when I go next, 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 and I'm at the last one, I want to let the user know through a message box you are at the last project, right? Once they reach the max, OK? So to do that, the best way to do that is simply to uh, check to see what is the maximum number. And if they're at it, let the user know through a message box here. If they're not, again, we're going to determine the row through the same formula. And I'm just simply going to determine what is the next one. As long as it's not 0, then N2 is simply equal to the project row plus 1. So whatever the one after that. Then we're going to run the macro that loads the project. This may not be necessary because any change to N is automatically going to add it. Great. So that's it. That's all we have to do for the navigation. Now we have another module called Project Macros. And we saw a few one. We saw one that we're going to save it. We saw load. So how do we get those to change? So the first one that we're going to come across is called Save Update. That is the macro that's been tied to this button called Save and Update. And this is the macro that not only runs when we click the button, Save button, it is also the macro that runs every time we change it 
tab so that no matter what, we are automatically saving whatever the user has entered here, it's automatically going to be saved. So let's pull up the larger job. So no matter what, whatever's here is gonna be saved. We're gonna look to see if it's been saved before. How do we know if it's saved before? Because there's gonna be a database row associated with this. If I add two different items to this, there's gonna be no database row associated with that. And so we know that automatically, actually, we gotta make sure, let's change that to general just so we can see it, right? We know that no, there we go. We know that no database has been, no database row has been saved with that because it has not been saved. As soon as we click saved, we see that we have a row that is now associated with that. So we can use that to determine that, okay? But the first thing what we wanna do is take all the information here and save it to our project database here. Determine if it's an existing or a new one, and either if it's a new one, save it to a brand new row, and if it is an existing one, update or accordingly. So that's what we're gonna do in here. So how do we know if it's a new one or an existing one? Because we're gonna look at the project row located in B2. If there's a number here, a value here, we know it's an existing one. However, if we create a new project, we can see that B2 is automatically changed to empty, and that is because it's based on the project ID here. The project ID is not found in this list. Take a look, it's not found here. So we know that it's looking for that, it's not It's not finding six here, so it's gonna return empty. So that's how we know if it's a brand new one or an existing one based on that, okay? All right, so we've got that going on, and what we'll do is we'll just continue with this particular macro, determining that. But I wanna make sure that before we save it, we have some essential items. I wanna make sure that we have at least a client. Now, to determine we have a correct client, I wanna make sure it's one that's been saved. B8 is gonna tell us if we have that. Now, B8 is a formula we're gonna match based on the client name. So what it's gonna do is gonna look up this, and it's gonna determine has this name found in the client list. If we look inside our formulas, and we have a name manager, we see we have a named range based on the client names, all the client names. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look whatever the user entered, is it found on this list? If it is, return the row that it's been found. That's what we're gonna use right here inside B6, that client row using the match based on F2. So, however, if it's not found, right, or if they just create a new one, if they have a new one, you see it's not found, client row is gonna be empty. So we wanna make sure that B8 contains a value so that they've added a correct client. So the first thing we're gonna do is ensure that B8 is not empty. If it is, we're gonna let the user know, know to please make sure to add a client to this project. We're gonna select F2, letting the user know that that's the one that they're gonna be entered. And I also wanna make sure that they've entered a date, right? If N3 is empty, I wanna make sure that we have at least a date there. So making sure we have a job date. So if N3 is empty, missing date, please make sure to add a project date before saving. We're gonna select N3. Next up, I wanna determine if it is an existing project or a new project, B2 is gonna tell us. Existing projects are gonna have a value. New projects, B2 is gonna be empty. Okay, so B2 will tell us. So if B2 is empty, it is a new project. For new projects, we want to determine a brand new row located in the project database. The first available row, in this case, nine. I also want to determine the next project ID. It's going to come directly from here, right? We've got it here. The next project ID is located right here using the max formula. Okay, so that's going to be the project row is going to be the first available one if it has not been previously saved. We're going to take that next project ID that's located in B3 with that max formula. We're going to place that project ID directly in N2, making sure that it is located right here, although it should be on new ones. And I also want to do is I want to take that project ID and I want to save it inside this database. So from B3, we're going to take it and we're going to put it in column A and then the first available row there that's gonna take on the project ID. What if it's an existing project? If it's an existing project, all we need to do is extract the project row from B2, because it'll already be here located in B2. Everything else is gonna happen whether it is a new project or an existing project, and that means we're simply going to update all the data associated. And we can run a loop to do that, right? So if we see here, this column here, we're gonna run a loop from column two all the way to 12, and we're gonna take whatever's in N3, we're gonna put it in that row. Take what is N4, we're gonna put it in that row. And so that's what we're gonna do through a data mapping loop. So that's the next part of our code. So what we're going to be doing, we're gonna first put that project ID, that's important because we're gonna to need to put that in the items, into a named range. I also wanna know the selected category that's gonna come from B5, that selected category, also very important. Here is that loop that we're going to run. And so using that data mapping and that loop, 
what we're gonna do is we're gonna run that loop from two to 12. And we're gonna take inside that project database, that project rows, that project column from two to 12. It's gonna be equal to whatever's in this range. That range is located in row one of our project database, that row up here. And basically we're gonna take all the information from N3 and 4 and B7, we're gonna place it in the row accordingly. Next up, what we wanna do is we wanna add or update the project items. I wanna determine all the items on the existing tab because if every other previous tab has already been saved as we switch tabs, I wanna to go to the last row, run a loop, right, from the first to last. I wanna to check to see if it's been saved. If it has been saved, I still wanna update it. If it has not been saved, determine the new row using that database row. So and is going to tell us that. So the first thing we want to do is determine the last item row based on E and 200. All right. And so the last item row, if it's less than nine, that means there's no items, right? right? The first one is going to be nine. So if it's anything less than that, that means there's no items. For the item row equals nine to the last row, we're going to get ready to run that loop. Again, we're checking to see if it's been saved. It's going to, that database row is going to be located in column in the item row. And that means if it is not empty, that means that it does have an existing database row. We're going to take that row and we're going to put it into a variable called project item database row. However, if it is a new database row, what we're going to do then is determine the first available row inside the project item database. And we're going to put that into a variable. For new items, not existing items, I want to put that project ID in column A. I want to put that selected category. Here's that important part. I want to put that selected category. That category is going to come from here. It goes into a variable called selected category. And it's going to go directly inside right here. It's going to go inside column B. So first the project ID, then the selected category in B. Also, I want to know the row that's associated only for new items. And we're going to put that row in column N. That is only for new items. Okay. And so that's what we're going to do. Inside column M, we're going to put the project item row. We can put the row in as well. And N, I want to put the data database row. M, what is M? M is simply the row that's associated, 9, 10, or 11, right? The row that's 9, 10, or 11. I want to know the row that we're putting in, which is the item row. Putting that item row in column M, putting the formula for the database row in column N. Then also, since we've just got the database row, we have a brand new database row, I want to put that new database row directly in column N. N here. So that new database row that we just created right up here is going to go directly in column N of the projects. Okay, great. So everything else we're simply going to save to the database. So all we need to do since it's in the right order is just take whatever's located all the way in here, all the way from here, and then just save it directly inside our project item all the way from here. So starting at the item date all the way there. Okay, great. So that's what we're going to do. So C is going to take, oh, first of all, the item ID is out of order. So C is going to be come directly from M. That is our item ID. That's going to come directly from here, M. That's like the ID that's associated with that item. I'll show you how that gets in there in just a moment. But that's the item ID that's associated there. That's going to call column C. Everything else from D through L equals D through L, meaning D here, the date, all the way through L, the total price, is going to go directly into the project items. Also, D through L, right? Total price. So everything, a column, column match is bringing it all in, okay? That's all we have to do to save the items, right? So what I want to do is I want to run that saved message, a project saved. This is a fade out message. It's going to run this. So when I run this, let's go into the projects here. You see that green fade out message here. When I run this, you're going to see that little green project saved message. The only thing is I don't want to run that Remember, we're running this save macro. I'm running it every single time I change that tab, right? But I only want to run that message when I actually, when the user presses the save button. So how can we differentiate? It's the same macro, right? We're running, but I only want this button to appear when the user selects this button here. How do we differentiate? that. Well, we can differentiate that because it's the same macro it's running based on what the user clicks, right? So if the user clicks, if we take a look at the save button, I've given a name called save button. Now let's take a look at this icon. Icon also here is also called, let's uh, finish that up. That macro is running. Once that macro is running, it won't appear here. If we take a look, it says save button here. So both the icon and the button have the same name. Both of them have the same macro. Of course, it is this save macro. So if I know what shape called the macro, I can use that to determine. Basically, if the user clicked this button, then run it. How do we know that? We can use application caller. That means the name of the shape that called it. If the application caller equals save button, we know the user clicked this and not one of these because it's the same macro running, right? If we put a stop here, 
let's go ahead and put the stop right here for the fun of it, right? I know the macro's running, right? We see it stopped here. So we know it's running, but we know that the application caller is, right? So let's go with, let's stop it here, right? So we know, let's take a look here and click here again, right? And make sure we'll continue with that macro already on and continue on. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to stop the macro when we go here. So let's take a look at application caller. Application caller is category three. It's not save button. So it's not going to run this fade out message. It's only going to run when the user clicks this button here. And so that's a great way to run the fade out message only when the user has a specific, even though we're running the same exact macro. Okay, very good. So that's how we get the information in. And that's how we, the save message is simply taking this shape and fading it out using a transparency. We've been over this a few times, so it, done almost everything new project how do we create a new project well that's the one that when we create new all i simply want to do is clear out some fields i want to set some defaults i want to set that project id to the next available project id i also want to set the date to the current date it's august 3rd and i want to set the status based on whatever that default status is located right here i also want to set the default that footer message is here if we change it to 90 but i want to set the default so when we click new i want to make sure that default goes to whatever the user has set directly inside here here in J14. So we want to do all that through new. So the first thing what we want to do is I want to set the project load to through through B1. We'll be returning it back to false when we finish. We're going to clear out all sorts of fields, clearing out all the fields here. I want to set the next project ID. That next project ID is going to come from B3. It's going to go into N2. I also want to set the current date into N3. I also want to set the default status, right? That's what we talked about coming from the admin and the default footer message here in 06. Setting the project load to false. And also the add or edit button, I want to make sure the add or edit button, I want to make sure that that is hidden, not visible. And we're going to select F2. That's going to select this and let prompt the user to then select a customer that they have to. So the best way to do that is just with the selection. All right, so that's it. Now what I want to do is I want to load that project in. I want to load all that project in. However, I want to make sure that we're only loading in this specific. And we've been over this. I'm just about to hide this again. So we have been over this. What I want to do is simply only load the items of whatever selected tab. So that means, let's say we're only focused on service, right? If I go previous, it's only going to load those items. Notice the tab stays on service. It's only going to load those ta service tabs, right? So it's going to be based on whatever the selected tab is. That selected tab name is here. We know based on the project items that it's linked directly to here. So we can easily load in only those because it's automatically linked. So project load. The first thing what I want to do is I want to make sure that B2 contains a number, right? If there's no row that's associated with the project ID located in N1, then we know that we have to let the user know that it's not a correct project. So if B2 is empty, please enter a correct project number. Exit the sub, nothing we can do. Project row into a variable. Right, B1 setting that to true. I want to clear the contents of all, all the cells associated, making sure that we don't clear N1 because that's very important. Right, We don't want to clear that. The user has either entered a project ID or they've used previous and next. So we want to make sure that not N1. I want to turn off application screen updating. We're going to run a loop, but this is a little bit different. Notice last time we went to 12. This time we're only going to 9. Why is that? Because we have items that are associated with formulas. The total cost is a formula. The total price is a formula. And the estimated profit are all formulas, right? I want to save those items to the database, but when I, I don't want to bring these items back because they're relative and they're, they're dependent on formulas. So I only want to go up to column number nine. I don't want to continue on. So that means if your database contains formulas, put them at the end, always at the end. That way you only have to run it to a specific column and then you can stop. And that's exactly what we're doing. So from two to nine, we are going to bring it. Basically, it's the opposite of the data validation. This time, we're going to look inside here and whatever is located in the project row and in the project column, we're bringing it into this range located in column one inside our project. Great. So that's it. Now loading the project item is very, very similar. We almost went over exactly that because we look, when we switch tabs, it's the same thing. We're going to determine the last row of our project item database row. I want to know the last row here. We're going to run our, of course, criteria here from O to Q, Q2 through R3. And then the results are going to appear there. Okay. So that's all we're doing. And our criteria Q2 through R3, determining the last row when we have our results coming through U2 through AF. So the same exact we did before. Also determining the last row based on V, the item name. If it's less than three, we're going to go to no items. Bringing in all the information in the formulas just like we did before.
and then turning off application screen updating and then making B1 default. So that's it. That's all. We only have to load the current tab. Right? Our formulas take care of everything else. Great. So that's, I want to stop there for right now and move on to some of the on screen. Notice we have some on screens, right? We're going to, the rest of them are going to come in from print and project. But notice that we have some on screen function, meaning when I make a change to this, I want to load up the details that's located in that description. That's going to be a change event based on E. And I want to load up, remember that item ID is also going to come in here. And that happens on change event E. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into directly the project sheet and we're going to look at some of the worksheet change events based on that. And we're focused on, we've got a few of them. I guess we just start at the top, it makes it a little bit easier. So the first one we went over on N2, we went over that. If the user makes a change to project ID, we're going to load the project. If we didn't, then we're doing it now. If the user makes a change there, all we're going to do is make sure it's not blank, and we're just simply loading the project that's associated with that number. Okay. All right, so that's this. N2 and N2 is not empty. We're simply going to run the macro, lo load the project. On change of customer address, right? When I make a change to customer address here, I want to make sure that we're loading the address, the city, and the state. However, if the user puts in a new one that is no longer there, I want to make sure that the user has not currently, would you like to add this client? Okay, great. So that's how we're going to do that. But before, I don't want to forget, there's one thing. Before we get to that, there's one thing that I want I mentioned to you that I want to make sure that I bring up to bring up to your attention. And that was the autocomplete. Remember I mentioned, let's go for a new project. Remember I mentioned that we can automatically complete it and that's really important. Let's see, we are on service. Some of, so some of the options here are um, monthly service, weekly service, and daily service. So if I type in DA, I wanna make sure that automatically comes in or MO. So how do we get autocomplete? Now notice that's in B9. If we change to equipment, right? Oh, we got to save the project. I still want, let's go ahead and collect and save that project. That's important. If we switch to equipment, notice that we have a different drop down list, but I also want auto complete to work here. So, how do we do that? Well, if we look all the way down in row, starting at 200 or 201, I believe, here, I have links. Now, these items are linked. This is going to use our autocomplete. I have a specific training just on this. So, basically, all we need to have is the same items inside the same column and they have to be linked through don't break the chain method meaning we need continuous cells of data it could be any data even space all the way to here so what do i do is i link items l3 l4 l5 and so on and so forth all the way down what is that link to inside our items we take a look here remember this item list l3 l4 so if i copy this list all the way down right no matter whatever the results are for the equipment if i copy that list I go into the projects and I paste those formulas, it's always going to be linked, okay? So that means, notice in 201, so if I change tabs, right, if I change it to items tab here, we see that inside our items, our results are different. We see that in our projects starting at 200, those results are then different, right? So if I start typing in bathroom vanity here, it's gonna automatically come up here, right? So. All we need to do that is, again, continuous cells. So what I've done here is I put a space. If we take a look here, there's a space here. I could just as easily put X. And also, I've done that here in a space because I don't want the users to see it. So the best way to do that, these double spaces here, I want to make sure that those spaces are continuous all the way down to row 200. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to go all the way down, continuous, right? And I'm going to paste it anywhere, like let's say here, here in column C. We only want column C, right? Pasting that down, pasting the values is fine. Then what I want to do is just create a link between that and column D. Then all I need to do is create that link. So that link is here. So let's put double space here. Now they're linked. Now there's a continuous column and row of cells with spaces. So now it will automatically work. If you break one of those spaces, so let's type in sync here, 30, it automatically comes up. So now we can have dynamic autocomplete the, based on the selected tab. So very, very cool. I'm glad I got to show that to you. I didn't want to forget that because that was kind of important. Okay, so let's continue back where we were on change of address of client ID. When I make a change to E2, I want something to happen. What do I want to happen? I want to load the address and details into it if, it, if the client exists. If it doesn't exist, I want to prompt the user to add in the client details. So if the user makes a change to F2 and F2 does not equal empty, then I wanted to mention the client row is long. Now what I want to do is I want to determine does the client exist or not. B8 is going to let us know. If I put in something different, 
Notice that B8 goes to empty and you get a prompt saying, do we want to add this client, right? B8 is now empty because that client has not been found in the list. So I want to differentiate. I'm going to do something different if it's found or if it's not found. So if B8 equals empty, what I want to do is I want to clear the contents of here. I want to clear that address, F3 through F4. I want to clear those out. And I also want to give the user an option, okay? So if the message box, F2 value, what is the F2? Basically, it's going to say whatever the user has entered here is not currently a client. Would you like to add this client? If VB yes uh, equals yes, then what we want to do is we want to run a macro called client add or edit, client add or edit. Okay. If it's not, we'll go over that macro right now. If the that's it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set that client row. It's going to be equal to B8. So that's all we're going to do. Run this macro and then we're going to exit the sub. However, if it is not, if we continue on, we know the client row is in B8, an existing client row. In B7, I want to put what the client ID. I want to take whatever client ID and I want to put that directly inside B7 here. This client ID, of course, mapped in B7, is mapped to the client ID located right here. B7 is located, so we can put the client ID directly in. That's kind of important because we run reports. In case the client name changes, the client ID will never change. So very important for that. Okay, continuing on. So we also want the client ID. So now what I'm going to do is I want to put that ID in, B, in B7. I also want to take the address coming from our clients. If we look at our clients, that address coming from column C, I'm going to take that and put that directly inside F3. So since we know the client row now from B8, we can do that. C is going to go into F3. In F4, I simply want to put the city, state, and the zip. The city coming from D, the state coming from E, and the zip coming from S. And putting that all into F4, separated by a comma and a, a, and a space, and then another space. So that's going to give us this nice address. And of course, that's going to come directly from here, city and D, E and F, right there. Okay, great. So we understand how we get that for existing clients, okay? So one issue is, of course, if they're not, how do we add them up, right? If I decide I want to add a new one here, right, let's say, let's just put in, how do we get that in there? So if I say yes, I want to then launch this form here. So how do we do that? Well, that's through this macro here called client add or edit, right? We want to add or edit that client. And that's going to come inside this module called client macros here. Now we have a form here called add or edit client. This is the form that you just saw. Going briefly over, it won't get into too much detail, but this is called field one. This is called field two, all the way to field seven. Those are the names of it. I've got a save button. When I click that save button, it's going to run this particular macro called client saver update. When I click the hide button, it's simply going to hide the form. So that's it for that. It's a relatively simple form. We don't need to go into do too much detail of that form. It's And I've just added a background using the same background of that. So it's relatively simple. There's not much going on. The only important thing that I would suggest you do is to make things a lot easier on you is name your fields. There's ways that it makes it easier in the sense that you can quickly using VBA, but if we look at this, we don't necessarily know what field that is. So the downside is we don't know what it is, but the upside is I'll show you in a moment. It's very easy to save because we can run a loop and save all seven of these fields very, very quickly in just a few lines of code. All right. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to run that macro, right? The client. First thing what I want to do is I want to build the client list. Well, actually, the first thing I want to do is add or edit the client. That's the one. But we also want to build the client list. I'll go over this in a moment. When we save a client, we re want to we want to build that list of client names. As you saw, right? There's a that that list automatically it's updated alphabetically. So I'll go over that in a moment in the proper order. Okay, but the first thing what we want to do, of course, from our projects database where we were, right? If the user answers yes, we want to run this macro, client add or edit. That's the one I want to focus on the first one, which is this one right here, client add or edit. That's the one that's going to launch that user form. Okay. So first of all, I want to clear out the form using unload add or edit client. That clears the fields in the form. Okay. Next thing what I want to do is if B8 equals empty, I need to determine whether it is a new client or an existing client. And that's very, very important because if it's a new client and I click this, I want to I want that information to show up. However, if it is an existing client, I want to that that existing client show up. I want to pull it from the database. So either it's going to pull the information from the database or it's going to pull the first name directly from here. And there's nothing going to be on the database. So we need to differentiate between that. So if B8 equals empty, we know it's a new client. All we need to do is take that first field, which is the name, and place whatever is in F2 and place that into it. 
Otherwise, it's an existing client. We got to load it up from the database. We're going to determine that client row from B8, setting that client row. Then we're going to run a loop, right, for the client row because one to seven. And this is where the few lines of code come in because it's very, very easy to add it. All we need to do up all the way at the top is make sure that we've dimensioned the client field as a control, as a control. That's very important. So as we move, we're going to set that client field equal to the add or edit client. Here's the form, the controls, the field, and then the client column. Remember that client column goes from one to seven, field one, field two, field three. So that's why it's so convenient to name them like this because we can then loop through them saving all the data. So the client field, the value of that is simply gonna come directly from our client database, our client row, and the client column plus one. Why is that client column plus one? We know that this is from one to seven, right? But if it's gonna pull up our name, where's our name located? Our name is located in column B, which is actually column two. So we know that we need, so the name is field one is column two. So we need to differentiate that. We know that field one here, we're setting field one here, is column two. So we wanna pull the information from column B. That's gonna do it. It's gonna put it directly in that field. So that's all we have to do to load all of the data from this value and put it directly into that form. And then last thing, regardless of it, if it's new or an existing, I wanna show the form using add or edit client show display form. Great, once the user has made those changes, I wanna also then of course save it, right? So if they've selected a client and we decide we wanna make some changes on that, we can do that just simply to save that information and clicking save. That is the macro that runs automatically from the user form once we click that save button. That, if we click on view the code, remember that is the macro that we're running when the save button, it is that client saver update. So that's the macro that we're gonna go over now. First of all, I wanna make sure that they've added a customer name. That client name is gonna be located in field one. If it's empty, we need to let the user to make, make sure to add a client name before saving. We're gonna exit the sub out. That client name is required. And again, I need to make sure that we're, whether it's a new or an existing, using B8 is gonna tell us, right? If it is new, we're gonna grab a new client row. We're gonna take that client ID, that next available client ID, we're gonna put it into B7, right? Where you know the next client ID because we're using a max formula. And I wanna put it directly inside B7. I also wanna take it and I want to put it in the first available here located in A. So that's what we're going to do here. A is going to take on that unique client ID. Else it's an existing client, all we need to do is extract the row directly from B8. Once we have done that, we can run a loop from 2 to 8, right? Column 1 is our client ID, so we don't need to add it. We've already added it in here. From 2 to 8, we're going to take basically the client information, the client field, just as we did before, the field and the client column minus 1, because our fields start from 1 to 7, so that's why we need to subtract 1 or here. And then we're just simply going to update the database with whatever's located in the value of that field. We're going to put that in the client row, client column. Going to update. Oh, then actually we just need to hide that form. And then I want to run the macro that's going to build that list, right? Building that list is very important because I want to then create a brand new list, a drop down list. That list is located right here. And I want that list sorted alphabetically, okay? So if we look in the formulas, name manager, we see that we have client name sorted. It is an offset dynamic named range for this sorted. It is that same name range that we're going to use here directly in here into the data and data validation. We see that it is the client name sorted list because I would like it sorted. I want to run the macro that's automatically going to sort that list every time we save a new file. So if I decide to change Dolores Richmond to Zolores Richmond, I want her at the end. If I save that, I want this to be at the bottom, right? So that's automatic. That way it's going to automatically be sorted automatically. That is the macro that we're going to run every time we save it. So if we look up here, that is the macro client build list. We're going to, with the clients, we're focused on the client sheet. We're going to determine that last row of the client sheet here. Then all I'm going to do is run an advanced filter without any criteria, right? We just want a unique list. I want to take all these names. I want to create a unique list of names and then I want to alphabetize them accordingly. So to do that, we're going to run advanced filter only on column B, which is our client name. We're going to have those results come to K2. Remember, there's no criteria here. Now, if we're running other types of criteria, if we're running other advanced filters on this sheet, and they have a criteria, we would have to delete that criteria before moving forward, okay? Keep that in mind. There are no other advanced formulas on the sheet, so we don't need to delete that criteria, but if there are, and those advanced filters use a criteria, we would need to delete it. We're gonna determine the last results row of the results here in K. If it's less than four, we can exit the sub on one or no results. 
one or no results, right? If there's one result, we don't need to sort a single result. But if there's no results, however, if there's more than one, we would need to sort it. So we're going to run the sort. We're going to clear any sort fields. We're going to add a sort key based on K3. That is the first name in that range. We're going to sort it ascending. We want A to Z here. And then also we want to, that particular range is going to be from K3 through K in the last results row. And that automatically will sort our list accordingly. So that's great. So we got that. That's going to be the one that's going to run automatically when we save and update. So the last thing we're going to do is just take whatever name that the user has updated or changed, right? Whatever name in that field one, and that means whatever name is located here, right? If I change this back to Dolores, I want that new name that we paid. I want it to appear directly right inside F2. So F2 must take on that field value of that one. It's going to set the client on the project, set that client name. Very good. That's it for clients. That's all we need to do to add in clients. Now, items you notice is very, very similar, right? So when we do items, when I select on it, I want to do, I want to either edit an existing item or when I select here, I want to add a new item if there's no item associated with that. And I want to determine whatever the category is, is the selected tab, I want to put that as the default. So that is the macros that we're going to be going over right now. Now, add or edit item is exactly the same type of form. Again, very, very similar. All we've done, again, is just name fields, same fields, different form. And again, with the save and cancel, right? So if I click on the save, we see that we have the save button called, you that's the client. Let's go in the forms. <laughs> that makes more sense. Okay, here's the form. Here's the category, right? Category, that's the only difference in this form that was client. We have a field called item category, and then we have field one, two, three, four, and five. Field five, right? So I have five fields associated with the item. Saving it, here we go. That makes more sense. The save button here for the item save and update, that's a macro that's going to run when we save the item. Or the cancel is simply going to hide that form. So that's it for the form. Very basic form here, and that's all we've done. The only difference in this particular form, I have a drop down list, and that drop down list is called item category. So we go into the item module macros, and we take a look here. We've got some information here. Now, the one thing we do want to do is I want to display this icon on the selected row. When I make a selection change, I want to display that. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's going to be based on selection change. So we go into the projects here and we go over here to selection change all the way down here, selection change. And the first thing what I want to do is no matter what the user selects, I want to hide that particular button. So anything the user selects, I want to hide it if it's visible. So if shapes add or add up item visible equals true, meaning it's visible, then hide it. So we're going to run that to hide it. Okay. Then what I want to do is if the user makes a selection from DL through L20, if they make a selection anywhere, what do I want to do? Well, I want to put that target row, I want to put it in B4. So that's the first thing what I want to do. So B4 is going to take on that target row, that row that's going to trigger the conditional formatting. Okay. Also in B10, B10 is going to I want to put in the item ID, right? If there's an item ID that's located in column M, I want to take that item ID and I want to put it directly inside B10. Notice B10 takes the item ID. If I select here, it changes to 11. Then what I want to do is I want to determine the row that's associated with that. And I can use, again, the match formula, but this is based on the item ID. I've got a named range for the item IDs, just as we had client IDs, just as we had project IDs. So everything is consistent here. So I've got a named range for item ID. And that's going to help us determine the row of item ID 11 using the match formula and then adding three. So we know that the item ID with item 11, the tile saw rental, is located on row 14 of the item. So if we look down here and we look at row 14, we see it's item ID 11, the tile saw rental. So we know that it's located on item 14. If we know what row it's lo located on, I can load up the rest of the details. However, if it's blank, right, then we know it's a new item, right? There's nothing associated in B11. There's no row. So we know that it is a brand new item or the user may want to enter an item. Okay, so that's what we're going to use. So here we go. B10 is going to take on whatever's L, if any, there's an item. Now, what if the user only when the user selects within E9? So when they select E9, I want to do something additional. I want to display this particular add or add item button shape. I want to display it basically in column F, and I'm going to move it over a little bit. So we can do that here with the shapes add or add item button. I want to display the left position based on column F and the target row plus 15. I want to move it over because that drop down list is going to take up some space. I want to move it beyond to the right of that drop down list icon. And I want to give it the top position of F in the top. And I want to make sure it's displayed. That's all we have to do. Of course, there's a macro that's assigned to this. If we take a look inside the individual 
individual shapes and right click and click assign macro we see that it is called the estimator item adder edit so if we click on the edit that is the particular macro that's the first macro that we're going to be going over inside the item macros module and just like the customers will move a little bit quicker now just like the clients the first thing we're going to do is clear that format using unload add or edit item we're going to focus on the project row i want to know the selected row what is the selected row in b4 that's very important because i want to get the information from the item that they've selected and that selected row is going to be located right here in b4 so that's going to put that into a variable called selected row if the selected row equals zero exit the sub right if i don't have a specific row we should exit the sub right because i one of the reasons why i need to know the selected rows i also need to know what specific item is located if any okay now what i want to do is i want to determine is it a new item or is it an existing item remember i said that item row is going to be located here if it's a new item b11 is going to be empty so if b11 contains a row we know it's an existing item if it's empty it's a new item so if it's a new item what do i want to do i want to take the category and i want to put it directly inside the item category and I want to put the field one so whatever the user has entered let's say they enter something like I want to enter a new item right let's say we have some new equipment and let's just say we have something like a saw uh, wooden saw tool let's say wooden saw tool okay so maybe we want to enter that in so if we click on here right I may want to enter that in so I want to put that name that they entered directly into field one and I also want to put the category that they're in inside the category here equipment right so if they switch to items and just put no we don't need to add that let's say we want to go into items but I want to add another item and let's say maybe I want to add in a new faucet so if I put in here faucet and let's just say white right so it's a new one I want to make sure that if we said yes I want to make sure that the categories items in this case and the name that they've entered is in here okay so to do that we want to make sure that we add in the particular field so to do that the item row let's go ahead the value of the first field is going to take on whatever's e in the selected row that's the name that they've entered and the category is going to come directly from b5 i want to put inside that category field of that form b5 b5 is right here i want to make sure that selected tab that's going to set that default right here setting that default to the category here it's going to pull it directly from b5 Okay, great. Once we have that, what if it's an existing item? If it's an existing item, all I need to do is extract the data from it, right? If they've selected an existing item, I want to make sure we pull all the data from that existing item. And so to do that, we need to determine the row. We know that the row is located in B11. So we're going to take that item row in B11, put it into a variable. And then we're going to run a loop just like we did with the clients, right? So the first thing what I want to do is I want to set the item category, making sure the category is going to be equal to B and the item row, right? Whatever category, it should be the category. Obviously, it should be this category. But basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take whatever B and the item row is, whatever is here located in the database, and I want to put that directly inside the form field called item category. Now I can run a loop just like we did before with customers from three to seven. We're going three. Why are we going three? Because we've always going from item name all the way to sales price from three to seven. And we're just putting those fields in. Now notice that our fields start at field one, field two, field up to field five. So that's why we need to subtract two because item column will start at three minus two is one. So field one, field two, we're simply going to add in the data we're going to create that field we're going to add it directly in from the items right from the items the item row and the item column bringing all the data filling up these item values inside this form and then lastly we're going to show the form i want to display that form and that is exactly how we can either show a brand new item with default category and item name or an existing item with all the data inside the item, okay? But what about when I wanna save it, right? If I decide I wanna save this item and I wanna add a description, white faucet, I wanna give it a unit type, let's say each, and I wanna give it a cost of $25 and selling it for $55 and saving it, I wanna make sure that that information gets saved to the database and it gets filled out here. So when we go into the items, we see that the faucet white, white faucet, and all the prices and everything got saved. That is the marker that we're coming up next called save or update. That is tied to that button, just as we did with the customers. It's going to be very simple. For, certainly, we want to make sure that we have an item name. If it's empty, please let the user know. We're going to get that selected row coming from B4, putting that into a variable. I want to know what row they're on, what is the current row that they're on, because that's the information that we're going to have to fill out. Then what I want to do is I want to check for new or an existing item, right? I need to know 
know are we saving to an existing row b11 again is going to tell us that going to set the item row based on if it's empty we're going to create a brand new row in the first available row inside the items sheet we're going to take that item id that next item id is going to come from b12 here i'm going to take that id i'm going to do two things with it i'm going to place it directly inside of b10 and I'm going to place it in the first column inside column A. So we can do that here. So B10 is going to take on that next item ID. And then column A is going to take on whatever's in B10. So that's going to set that unique item, unique item ID. However, if it's an existing item, what I want to do is I want to just extract it from B11. Everything else we're going to do regardless if it is a new or an existing item. We're going to take that category, going to come from B, right? That's going to come directly from B. It's going to go inside whatever that value the user has entered. It's going to go directly into column B in the items. That is the category. Then we're going to run that loop from 3 to 7 just as we did before. But this time we're taking whatever is located in that field value and we're placing it directly inside the database here. Then we're going to add and hide that item. Then what I want to do is I want to reset that item selected item list. And why is that important? Because that's important because I want to make sure that that item list now contains that list, right? I want to make sure that the selected item list contains that value. Notice that these are also in that value in the selected item list. How do I know that? That's going to be located right here. This unique name, I want to make sure that they're located here inside the items list so that it's available. Remember, it's got to be in this list. So if they add that new uh, faucet white here, it's got to be added in this new list here. That's select item list. So we need to run that macro. So or we, or we can, in this case, we could just run the advanced filter. So reset the item list. The last row, if it's less than four, we're going to run an advanced filter based on J2. We just added the item. Right, we just added the item to the database, right? But I want that fossil white, I want that to appear inside our selected item list. Running the advanced filter one more time, basing on the item, it's gonna put those results here. That is gonna be that list. Again, once again, just to review, it is this list here. If we look into the data, I know there's a lot to cover in this here. Data validation, item selected tab. This is the one, this is the list that I'm populating, right? By creating that advanced filter, having those results here, it is this where it's going to be displayed to make sure that that white faucet appears not only in here, but it's also available when I type in faucet and then white, I want it to appear in autocomplete. So it also must be at the bottom of this, right? We also want to make sure it's down here at the bottom here, making sure that it appears here as well. Okay, so that's important. So we have that there. So that's why we're going to run this advanced filter one more time. And then lastly, what I want to do is whatever the user had put in there, right? If they change the name, I want to make sure that that changed name, right? If I make a change to this, and I want that change to be reflected, right? So if I change, uh, let's just say white sink, right? If I, oops, let's try this. White sink. I want to make sure that that new name appears also in here. So I want to take that new name and appear directly in here. I'll show you that once more. So making the change here, anytime we make a change, I want to make sure that, whoops, backspace here, gets saved in that update. So making sure that E and the selected row gets updated with that field name. So E and the selected row gets updated with whatever that field name is. And that's the set the item on the projects. And that's going to reset it so that any changes, not only any changes, maybe changes in the description or changes in the item cost or any changes, also get auto populated directly on this sheet so that there's changes very very good i'm glad we got caught up with that that's it for items so we've been over the clients we've been over the items we've been over the project and then we just have ones on the project sheet right we've actually taken care of those as well so actually just a few more in the project so we've got that and we've co covered save we've covered new we've covered load we haven't covered delete yet and project pdf print and email we're going to cover those right now we did cover the navigation okay so now that we understand that the item database row is here we can delete these and what i'd like to do is return these back to the original so what i'm going to do is i'm going to highlight that i'm going to go into the home and i'm going to set that particular custom number format to just the semicolons we can use one semicolon thank you ben four numbers or three four alphanumeric three semicolons okay so that's going to be sufficient now they're hidden now we can move our group our mini dashboard right here back up looks like it got a little bit uh updated here so we'll bring that up very good all right so let's cover some of the other additions we went over this so let's continue on the project macros right we left off here we covered the project load but what i want to do is i want to generate that project that's very important if I print this out, obviously, here's one of the challenges, right? If I want to print this, I've got them on three 
or eight different tabs. How can I print this or how can I generate with everything on one columns, but everything in one area so that we can easily print and have all the items regardless of the category and printed? Well, what we can use, we can use another range for that. So if we slide over here, you may have seen it already. I can have the duplicate here. So this particular one's automatically. So if I decide that we're going to print it or create an email or, or anyone, it's going to run a macro that's going to generate that. Notice this has just a few items and it's going to print that out. However, if I run one of the larger ones, let's say we go to project ID one, which has a lot, it's going to load that up. And of course, if I print that, it's going to print it out to the default printer and notice it's got a lot of items, right? So let's snag it to my default printer. So here we have to take a look. We have items, we have equipment, service, and they're all separated nicely. And we've got a really great range that we can print or email or, or create a PDF based on that. Okay, so let's go over this. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to create a, an additional icon, some information, and a, a just a little bit of a shape here. And I want to have some information that's linked to the original cells. F2, F3, and F4 are all linked to the information located on the original project. And I've got, again, also links project ID, the date, and of course, we have the total price. However, if we want to show, notice the date and the costs are missing. However, if we change to go back to include the date, on the admin screen and include the cost. When we generate that here, it's going to automatically run. So we've got a macro. That I didn't show you that macro yet either. So we've got a macro that's simply going to unhide this and unhide those cost columns. Okay, so they're created automatically. And so when we print it, we want to be able to print it. So let's go ahead and focus on the macro that's going to create this automatically based on that. Okay, so we're going to go in. It's called Project Generate. This is the macro before we create an. PDF before we printed, this is the macro gets run. The print and the email are down here in the create PDF. Okay, so it's called project generate. I want to generate that project. All right, so the first thing we want to do inside this macro is clear the contents of the existing cell. Certainly, we don't want to have any data in here. So the first thing we're going to do is just clear it out, clear all those contents out. Next up, what I want to do is I want to focus on get the initial item row. We're going to keep track of the rows as we move down there. So we're going to start the first row after row seven, and then it's going to grow as we build in the data. All right, continuing on, now I'm going to focus on the project item database, right? We want to bring in all the project items based on one specific project ID located right here in queue. And the categories, however, are going to change. I'm going to have, we're going to loop through all the categories and I'm going to have VBA control put the category in here. So notice there's the categories commission here. So what we're going to do is going to use this is our criteria as we run in advanced filters. We're going to loop through all the categories here, each one, and we're going to check for data inside those categories based on the project. Placing that particular category directly inside P3 through VBA, running an advanced filter, and then having any of those data available, and then bringing them over directly inside here, along with a title. Okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. So we're going to run that advanced filter, determine the first row, the last available row of the project item database based on the last row of data. If it's less than four, we're going to exit the sub. That means there's no data. We're going to turn application screen updating to false, and we're going to loop through the categories, category row being along seven to 14. It's going to come directly from our admin screen. Notice that we have seven to 14. 7 through 14. We want to make sure that there's a value, of course, in there. It's going to come from C and that. So we're going to take on that. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to then clear out all of the contents from the previous data. Our results are going to come from U through AF. Column U here all the way through AF. Those where the results are going to come, but I want to clear those out. Each time we loop through, we want to clear it out clearing out all of those results. So we're going to do that there with this line of code. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take that particular category from admin C in the category row. And as long as it's not empty, we are going to place it directly inside P3 right here, up here, P3. Once we have it, that is going to set our category criteria. We're ready to run our advanced filter based on a3 and through N in the last project item database row. So it's going to go A3 all the way through N in the last row. The criteria is going to be P2 all the way through Q3. Of course, the project ID is already linked to whatever's in N2 because we're putting the existing category. P2 through P3. So what that's going to do inside here, and our results are going to come P2 through Q3. The results, we're going to determine the last row again based on that item name in column V, just as we did before here. That's the last results row. If it's less than three, then we have no category items. We can skip all of this, right? 
Otherwise, if there is values, we're going to do a few things. The first thing what I want to do is I want to take that category and I want to place it directly inside here. I want to put it right here, that category. So if we put in items, right, let's just say we put in items here. I want VBA to put in that items. I want conditional formatting to color that row, but I want it very specific. I want that row colored only if there's values in this cell, but not in others. You see when we print it, let's go ahead and print it out. And what that's going to do is generate that. Could have just run the macro. That'd be a little quicker. So what I want to know is I want to know cells that contain information in column S, but nowhere else. I don't want to give those a bold. I want to make sure they're uppercase. Of course, uppercase, we're going to take through VBA, and I'm going to give it that blue color. So if we take a look in some conditional formatting, here we also have some conditional formatting set. So if we manage those rules, we're going to see we have three conditional formats. The first one is going to be used only for categories. If we edit that rule, we can see that we see that S, starting in row 7, does not equal empty, meaning there is something there. And I want to make sure that T is equal to empty and U is equal to empty. So that means that there is going to be no description and no quantity. So any type of row that has no description and no quantity, but item, we're going to assume that that is a category. We're going to give it that bold color and a blue background. Otherwise, they're going to be alternating rows, making sure that this condition of learning appears above anyone else so that that one takes priority. For, of course, here we have even rows or odd rows. If we edit that, we see that that's for odd rows, right? Odd rows along, we want to make sure that S7 does not equal empty and U7 does not equal empty. And for odd rows, we're going to give it that light blue color. And for even rows, we're going to give it just a little bit of a lighter color. They're almost the same color. And these are for even rows. So even and odd are going to give it a color. We could probably change that to a little bit of darker. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to see. Giving it a fill, maybe we'll give it a fill effect. If we want a little bit darker color, we can do that. Or we can give it a more colors and just give it a little bit darker, right? About there. Okay, that's a little bit darker there. It's a little bit more apparent. There we go. So it's a darker row. So we can see that our odd rows are colored blue, while our even rows are colored white. And then our rows that contain only an item and nothing is going to give a blue color for our categories. So I want to place that category directly in column S in that row. So we're going to do that right here. Column S in the item row, the item row is going to change, is going to, we're going to use U case. I want the upper case of whatever that category is in the atom and C. I'm going to set that category in upper case. Then we're going to increment the item row. And then what I want to do is I want to bring over all the items associated with that category through projects R through Z and the item row plus the last results row minus three. Last results row minus three. And basically what that's going to do is bring in all the items from R all the way through Z. And it's going to come directly from here, from U all the way through here to AC. And it's going to bring all those items directly in here. So that's all we have to do. Then all we need to do is update that item row. So the item row, we need to increment. It's equal to item row plus the last results row minus two, meaning the next item row so that the next item row is going to be located right here. So minus three would be here, minus two would be here. So now we're ready in place to add that next category. As we loop, continue on with our loop. So we're just going to simply loop through all of our categories. For each one, we're running the advanced filter. If there is data, we're going to place that category in uppercase, and then we're going to bring over the data. That's all we have to do. Next up, I want to set a footer. Now, I have a floating footer. This footer is based on shapes, and basically, it's just several shapes here. And I want to place that directly here so that we can print that out. So this shape, I've got a text box here. Now, this text box is located at B. B33. And B33 is our footer message. Now, if we remember, our footer message name is located right here inside O, let's pull that up, O6 uh, here. So we've got a drop down list of our footer messages right here. So we can drop it down and select different footer messages. So if I want the footer message based on this name, if we look inside B33, we have the footer message text. We've got two named ranges, one for the name and one for the actual text. So if I'm going to index that text, that's what I want to extract, and I want to know what row it's on, it's going to be whatever row is based. When we use the match format, based on looking up that name in 06, we're going to run it based on the array of message name. We want the exact match, and we want column one. If there's an error, we're going to return empty. So basically, when a user makes a change here, we're going to then change that. So that's going to automatically change this text to whatever it is. Basically, we're looking up this name, and we're extracting this text. And we're going to place that text because that text located B33 is linked to this shape. It's going to display that shape 
this particular shape located in B33. We've got some other shapes here. We've got some totals here that are also going to be displayed in the footer. I've got a shape, this one shape, simply with the subtotal text. Sales tax, this one's going to be dynamic because we don't know what we're going to call it. Maybe we're going to call it GST at 8% or whatever in the admin. So if we change the tax here, right, if I change this inside this, let's pull that up at, let's say, 8%, and we want to call it GST, I want that name and that rate reflected inside that footer. So if we go back to projects, we see that it now says GST at 8%. So I want that link. So this shape is now linked to B26. So let's take a look inside B26 and take a look at that. So let's bring this out a little bit so we can see it. So now so we see the estimate is good. So I could have, should have brought that out before. So B26, if we're taking a look, we see that it's GST. The tax description is basically if the tax option equals no, meaning they do want to charge tax, they don't want to charge tax, we're going to show blank. If they do want to show tax, we're going to put in whatever tax name that is. That's a variable, whatever tax name, GST then a space, and then I want to put that tax rate. I don't want to format that tax rate using the text function on a percentage-based text. So that's going to give us the text. So if I link that to a shape, it's always going to show that dynamic shape. If tax is no, it's going to show up as blank. This particular one, the tax, now I've got the, the subtotal here, B30, the tax located B31, and the total B32. So if we simply link to those and take a look at those. So we have the subtotal price. Now we take a look at that again. I want that subtotal. I'm going to sum if. Again, we're going to use our existing here tab. If the, if the items is selected tab, we're going to total this. Otherwise, we're going to come whatever's in the database. And that's just what we have here. So sum if the project items, project and two project. So we're going to minus, so we're subling, subtotaling everything in the database, the project items, every item in the database, regardless, this in case, regardless of category, everything gets summed inside that number. So this is there. However, I want to subtract out whatever is in the current category. How minus whatever's in the current category right here. So the current category gets subtracted out and then we're going to go ahead and add in this, right? So we're adding in this here in the last part, summing else. So that's another way to do it. We're simply adding everything in, subtracting out the current category, but adding it in back here. Based on, so that way, if the user makes live changes before they saved, those changes get added in. And that's going to our subtotal price. Our subtotal tax is simply if the tax option equals no, meaning they don't want to charge, we're going to show empty. Otherwise, we're going to multiply the tax rate plus B30. We could probably make that zero. Probably should be zero. Zero is okay, but that way zero is going to show zero if it's not. And so otherwise, it's simply the tax rate times 30, B30, where it's in B30. And then we have our total price, which is simply the subtotal plus the tax, and that's going to get us our total there. Okay, great. So I'm glad I got to show that to you. That was the subtotal price. So those are all linked to the footer. Now, now that we understand how we make up this footer, I've created a group of all these shapes, and we'll call it a footer group. And back into our macro, I want to place that footer group. Basically, I want to place it. We know our last item row is here. I want to add to our last item row and make sure we place that directly on the top here. So again, we're going to do with the projects footer group, right? The projects R1, we're going to set that left position. We're going to set the top row based on the last item row. We've already incremented it here. And we're going to set the width. Now, the reason I want to set the width, I want to make it a dynamic width, right? Because remember, sometimes we're not showing, we're not showing our date right? We're not showing sometimes our cost, but I want to make sure the width of that footer is based on column R through Z. So we're going to take the width of those columns and we're going to set that default footer to the width of that. So we can do that here. So the width is simply equal to projects, the width of columns R through Z, setting the width and making sure that it's visible, although it always should be visible. Okay, now we're ready. So now we've got that footer just the way we want it. Now what we want to do is we want to update the print area because we're going to need this print area. We know the print area is going to start in R1, but what's the end? We're going to use the item row plus we're adding on to that. So the print area is simply equal to projects, page setup, print area, R1. We know it starts with that. We know it's going to end with Z and it's going to be the item row plus two. So that sets our print area and we're going to turn on application screen updating. 
Very, very simple. So if I want to print it, right, if I want to run that print, that's the same macro that we've been doing with this button here. All I need to do is run the previous macro that we just went over, the project generate, running that first, and then just printing it out, making sure that we're setting it to the print default area and making sure that we are honoring the print settings, right? And putting it to the default printer and making sure that we are honoring that page setup, the print area. That is okay. So that's it. So for print, now what about if I want to create a PDF? Well, if I want to create a PDF, again, we're going to run the macro that generates all of that, making sure it looks nice and neat and generating all that. And then all I want to do is create a file name for that PDF. Now, file name, we're going to use the current workbook path. That's the easiest. We're going to add a backslash onto that. And I'm going to give it a specific name. I'm going to give it that customer name located in F2. And then I'm going to use underscore and project. And I'm going to use that project ID located in N2, making sure it ends with .pdf because that's what we're going to create. Once I have that file name exactly, what I want to do is I want to delete it. If that exact file already exists in the folder, it could create it if we try to create it again. So we're going to check if it exists using the directory function, then we're going to kill the file, delete the file if it exists. Then we can create that PDF using the project's export as a fixed format, type as PDF, and the file name, false and true. We want to, I want to display it after, right? This one, this particular one, if we take a look, let's go backspace, we can see that. Okay, so we can see open after publish. I've got that true set to true. So we're going to open that. However, when we create an email, I'm going to use the same thing, but I'm not going to, I'm going to put it as false, right? Export. So this one is false when we do the email because I want to display it. And that way, when we create the PDF, which is and all I need to do is just click project PDF here. It's going to create that PDF and it's going to display it. So it's going to run that generate. It's going to display that and it's going to create that pdf notice the name johnny james project one pdf so it's got that nice project in pdf all ready to go okay and lastly project email before we get to that little mini dashboard i gotta do the email it's very very simple we're going to generate that just as we did before making sure that we've saved the project right to do that probably should have done it on on printing too but that's okay file name is simple we want to make sure that we have a set of file name just as we did before just as we did with the pdf and then we're going to create the PDF. This time we want to email it. So we've got the PDF already created based on this file name, right? Now all we need to do is create an email. We're going to dimension the Outlook app and the Outlook as objects. We're going to do that up here. Both of them must be objects. We're going to create that email using the Outlook app application. Okay, so doing that right down here, export Outlook app equals create Outlook application and then we're going to create that email associated with that I'm going to set it to right i know the client row is located in b8 if i know the row of the client and i want to extract the email address i know that customer row is located right here in b8 if i know that and i look at the clients and i know that their email is located in column h then all i need to do is just say clients column h plus the client row that's our client email attach that file name adding that file subject setting some kind of a dynamic subject nothing in the body and then displaying it that's it that's it for email all right the last one on this particular module is the delete so first of all we want to give them a confirmation are you sure you want to delete this project yes or no if the project's b2 we need to know has it been saved or not right if they decide if we're in a project and we create a brand new project and we put in a customer and put in some information we decided we want to delete it right we don't need to continue on much we don't need to delete the database row so how are we going to do that let's just update this column properly should probably change that to move but don't size with cells so it's updated properly there we go so what i want to do is i want to simply delete it we don't need to delete any of the database get that confirmation and just click project has been deleted and add new. So it's very, very simple if we have not yet, of course, created one. So what we want to do, however, if it's saved, is to make sure to delete it both in the project database and the associated project item rows located in the project item database. So we need to do all the rows. So to do that, what we want to do is run through the macro. So B2 is going to let us know if it's been saved. If it hasn't been saved, we can skip all of this. We're going to get that project row from B2. That's the row of the project that we need to delete. So the project database, project row, and project row, entire row delete. This will delete the project row. But I also need to delete all the items associated with that project focused on the project item database. Running an advanced filter, right? Getting those results in UAE2. We've been over this. Determine the last row of that results. If it's less than three, we have no items. I want to sort those items based on reverse descending, meaning the highest row associated with first, right? If I want to delete this and I go to the project item database and I've got a bunch of items here, but what I want to do is I want to delete all the items associated. So only the project D, not based on category, all the items associated. So our 
criteria is going to be only Q2 through Q3, right? Q2 is where our criteria is, is Q2 through Q3, just the project D. Regardless, regardless of category, all the items. But then once I get them, I want to base it on the project row. Notice this, I want the reverse. So that means I want, in this case, I would delete row 14 first, then nine. So I want to, I want to basically sort them based on AF and I want it descending. So the highest database row appears first. So we delete row 14, then we delete 13 and so on and so forth in reverse. So to do that, we're gonna to have to sort it. Okay, so we're gonna clear all the sort fields. We're gonna base it on AE, project row is the row associated with the project. This is the database row, I should have labeled it database row. This is the one we want. So 25 would be first and then it goes down. So AE is correct, right, AE. And then we're gonna go AE3. This is the row on the project is insignificant for our purposes for delete okay okay continuing on so we're going to delete that sorting it based on descending and then we're going to loop through each row from three to the last result row putting that row into a variable called project item database row from AE that's where it's coming from that's the project item row then we're going to delete a member when you have to delete it you always want to delete in reverse the highest row first 25 8 and 0 so that's very important and then no results and then just letting the user know the project has been deleted so if we create a brand new project here Creating a brand new project, selecting a customer here, and then we don't need we don't need the project name. We're just going to delete it. Saving that project, adding some individual items in here, saving those items here, any whatever service or whatever, and then we can save it. And then we're going to delete it. So I'm going to save that project. And then I'm going to delete that project. Let's do no for now. We'll take a look inside the project item database. Going down to the last row, let's take a look all the way down. That's project item seven. We've got three items associated with that here on rows 93, 91, and 92. So we'll put those in reverse. If we go into projects and we delete that and we click yes, we want those gone. The project has been deleted. When we go back into the project, we see that there is no project item, no more items for number seven. If we go into the project database, there is no for seven. We don't have that. And so everything has been deleted. Okay, fantastic. So we've covered the macros for the projects, right? Lastly, all we have is this really cool dashboard and we have some data here so i want to know the profit associated with a particular job if i want to know that profit and i also want to know how much the estimated profit the total price the total cost of a job and i want to know the prices per category i want to know the category how much commission how much items on this particular and i want it to make sure to show live right as we're doing it okay so what we do is we create a little bit of information here on the item so i want to know basically a linked all of our project categories and then i want to do it just a sum if again we're going to use the same formula i want to sum if i want to sum all the saved items However, if it's on the selected tab, I want to use column L. So we're doing exactly the same formula here. Again, if, if it equals a, AE17, right, if B5 equals, if it, this means it's the selected tab, the selected tab, we're summing what's in column L. Otherwise, we're summing it from the database. Remember, we're summing it based on whatever's located here, that category that's located in AC and 17 right here. So it's, we're summing it based on the category of AC17. So as we bring this down, it sums it all on the categories and whatever selected categories, we're gonna use the current. So I've got that. I also I wanna know the totals, right? We're having the same exact totals. I've just used the same formula, L2, L3, and L4. So basically our totals here, our totals here are just located to B29, B32, and B L3, L2. So we have the total cost here located in B29. Those are the same formulas we went over here. Cost we didn't really go over, but it's exactly the same as what we did before. Cost, the only difference is we are totaling the product project items total cost. That's the only difference, the total cost. And we're doing, instead of column L, we're doing for the select item, we're doing column J. So that's gonna do the total cost. Otherwise we do total price. So I also wanna know the cost. That cost is gonna go up here. It's also gonna go here, right? So we know the total cost. And I also wanna know plus the total tax and the total cost. So basically the subtotal cost is exactly the same as the other, except we're just summing different columns, okay? All right, so we've got the cost here. So it's gonna bring it over here. So basically the total cost is located what's in L2, the total price is in L3, and the estimated profit is in L4. So we have basically just linking to whatever is located right here. L in estimated profit is simply the total price minus the total cost, okay? Very, very simple here. So I wanna put those into it. So I've just built a graph according, and I also want another profit percentage. So I just created a donut chart based on this. So if we select here and we create a donut chart, we can do insert, right? And we take a look inside of pi and we wanna create a donut chart, chart here. 
and we want to check maybe we'll do the colors associated with our color theme here so we'll select on those colors we can then add a chart title we can then add of course different data labels if we want we want to add data labels we can and then we just format those accordingly and this one we would just set we can also set here format those if we click on the format the data series we can also change the size of the donut right we want to change that if we want to change it of course we can format those relatively simple so that's all i did for the donut so we can delete that and just customize the chart tunnel relatively simple for the pie chart again very very similar just bringing down the data inserting that for the pie chart this one we just use a simple pie chart setting the color based on our theme here and then of course we customize it showing the labels accordingly and then showing that that's pretty much it it's kind of relatively simple on the dashboard just something to give us a quick notice and for the profit all i did was have to link a text string based on a to af20 right or i could have linked it to right here either one it's going to show our profit there's the same thing l4 would just be fine so either one of those is going to be fine and what i want to do is i want to make sure that it is formatted right so you'll notice that this particular profit has been formatted if error all we want to do is divide af19 by af18 and that's going to get us our estimated profit percentage okay i'll be probably adding more on this from our patreon campaign right if you want to see something else if you want to see us hit certain profit limits or do something when we hit it or maybe you want me to expand on a dashboard i can do that for our patreon members i'll be adding this i hope you will join us there because it's a fantastic platform with tons of great content don't forget we also have 250 of my best templates that's an incredible buy we got that that's available so you can click the links down below i do appreciate your continued support as always don't forget to subscribe click the subscribe description like this video comment below i'd love to hear your thoughts what do you think about this what else in fact i've also got a brand new freelance course coming up in a few months freelance course is going to be regardless of whatever trade you're in it won't have anything to do with excel but it's going to help out freelancers not only get jobs but uh, create really great value and of course get paid to do that wherever you live in the world so i'm working on that if you've had any pains problems challenges or issues that you want me to address in the course now is the time to let me know feel free to email me randy at excel for freelancers.com comment below or put it in our group i want to hear feedback from you so i can make sure it's the best freelancer course or freelancer academy i'll probably be calling it in ever created all right thanks so much and we'll be seeing you perhaps next week or the next week after as we'll be creating these every other week okay thanks again see you next time mm -hmm.